Welcome to the meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees for the Town of Buena Vista, Colorado. This is September 12th, 2023, and the time is 7 p.m. Um, Paula, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Fay? Here. Trustee Cobb? Here. Trustee Hilton Hinga? Here. Trustee Lucrezzi? Here. Trustee Rice? Here. Trustee Rowe? Not seeing them online yet. Okay. And Trustee Swisher. Yeah. Then would everyone please silence your cell phones if you have them with you? Uh, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands. Thank you. Please, you have um, an agenda in front of you. And I'd like to know if anyone has any um, comments or changes in the agenda. If not, would someone like to make a motion to? Um, accept the agenda as drafted. So moved. <coughs> Second. McCretzi and Cobb. And um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? <coughs> Motion passes. And then you have the consent agenda as well. The consent agenda has um, minutes from some of the advisory boards, the Beautification Advisory Board and the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, as well as our minutes from our last meeting. In addition to that, there's a, um, a approval of a contract uh, for a company called Valerian LLC for the final design of the Billy Cordova Memorial. <coughs> Since that um, contract is for more than $25,000, uh, we need to have a roll call vote to accept the consent agenda. Um, does anyone, first of all, have any changes that they'd like to see in the consent agenda? So I'd like to just call out one item, and that is the Billy Cordova uh, Park uh, contract or agreement. Um, I, I wanted to ask, um, and I'm not sure if the uh, staff are here who can answer this, but just uh, what consideration is being given in that park uh, design to um, Accessibility, inclusive, inclusivity, and and adaptive uh, uh, features, um, and also what experience this group may or may not have with that. Anyone? Um, yeah, I, that's a good question, and I think that's one of the key features of, or several of the key features of the park. Uh, recognizing that the town doesn't have its existing parks are somewhat limited in terms of accessibility, especially, um, and so. Uh, that was a big part of the GOCO grant, the success of the GOCO grant, some of the other grant funding. Um, I would ask Shane to share a little bit more specifics to that, but I do know that um, in terms of AD, ADA access and some other things like that, uh, those are key components of it. Uh, certain that goes into the surfaces and materials that are used, the proximity to um, the trail and the parking and things like that for it. So uh, definitely a big part of it, but let's have the rec team share maybe next time in their report some of those details. Okay, if great. that's okay. Sure, thanks Philip. Sure. Does anyone else have um, questions or changes to the consent agenda? Would someone like to make a motion to accept the consent agenda as drafted? I so move. Second. Thank you, Cobb and Swisher. Uh, we need a roll call vote on this, please, Paula. Trustee Cobb. Yes. Trustee Swisher. Yes. Trustee Hilton Hinga. Yes. Trustee Lucrezzi. Yes. Trustee Rice. Yes. And has Trustee Rowe joined us? Yeah, let me move him to panel. <coughs> Yes. Trustee Rowe, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Great. 
Yeah. Would you like to vote on the consent agenda item? Yeah, I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. So the motion passes. When you came in, there was a clipboard to uh, sign up to make a public comment if you would like to. And um, in this time of our meeting, you will have three minutes and make a comment. You can start out with your um, name and address for the record, and then your three minutes begins at that point. So um, we have several people signed up and Norma Katie is our first one. <coughs> Would you approach the podium, please? <coughs> okay, I'm Norma Katie, and um, I don't live in town anymore, so I don't even know. Anyway, I live at 9855 um, Highway 24, 285. Anyway, so what else do I both say? That's it. Okay, please begin. Um, this is the heads up about the status of the bench in honor of Ukraine of the town I used to live in. And finally today, I got the design. They've been really busy from Art Valley Welding. So they sent it on the email. I was going to show it to you, but I couldn't. I don't have. I Anyway, I don't. I'll we'll make a copy of it. We can get it on paper pretty soon. So the design has been done. It's a bunch of sunflowers on the back of the bench. And then it says Kremina, my town. And we may, we may ask them to put down Ukraine on it somewhere so people know what that means. But anyway, so that's gonna happen and they're, they're hoping they can get to it in the end of October. So we'll get there somehow, but we, I, and so in saying that we're gonna try to, I'm gonna put an article in the paper because I'm gonna try to raise some money because now we gotta pay them so we've got about $800 in the bank, but we need a lot more. So we're gonna do that. And then only the little thing I'll say in conclusion is that my cohorts in Ukraine are doing some incredibly amazing things in community development work. And I'm excited to share that with you. And maybe we can do a sister cities with them. Who knows? If, what's going to happen. So anyway, just wanted to give you a heads up. Thank you, Norma. And next we have Alan Robinson. Please come to the podium and give us your name and address. And yes, um, my name is Alan Robinson. And I live in Mount Harvard State, North of Venus, 33700, Mount Harvard Circle. Um, a spoiler alert really is that I'm here to ask for some money. But I'll get to that at the end of um, well, uh, my three minutes. Um, some of you may know me from my long association with the Greater Arkansas River Nature Association, where I was board chair in the early days, and for my work in developing the city byway and for my leadership in the Friends of Four Mile chapter. Uh, <clears throat> But since 2010, I've been leading another government-sponsored effort, which is the Salida to Red Stage and Rail Historic Route. Um, and we've, we've, we've had several different grant supports for our feasibility study phase and for a, a master planning phase and several years of implementation and getting, getting the route designated. Uh, for the most part, it doesn't involve uh, developing or building any new trail. It follows uh, existing routes, low volume county roads and existing trail systems um, through Salina and through Buena Vista and, and through Leadville. Uh, in many ways, it's a low speed addition or alternative to the scenic byway experience uh, because it focuses and gives an opportunity to provide a, 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 a interpretation of the the heritage and significance of the, the, the Midland Railroad route and the old Canyon City to Leadville State Road. That's why it's called, obviously, the State and Rail Historic Route. Um, in 2016, it gained support uh, from uh, Governor Hickenlooper's 2016 
program to identify 16 trails that deserve to be completed. Most of the effort has been, been funded by the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, <coughs> grant program, and uh, the town of Buena Vista has consistently been supportive of these three or four grants in the past to the tune of a couple of thousand dollars. Um, so designating the route is almost complete, um, but uh, we need to, to, to now shift our focus to education, interpretation, development of visitor friendly brochures and mapping and that sort of thing. So we're, we're actually applying for another CPW grant for about 60, uh, the total project would be about $60,000 and $45,000 of that hopefully would come from the CPW trails grant program. We're, we're approaching the two boards of county commissioners for $3,000 in match money each. And we're approaching the three towns, including Vita Vista, for uh, about $1,800 in, in match funding. Uh, the more match funding we have, the stronger our application is, as you undoubtedly know, when you show local support. We would need a, uh, um, a letter of support, uh, hopefully, uh, in time for us to, to be able to uh, to assure uh, in our application that that we had the support of of the university. I'd be happy to to follow up with with any details that I need to do. Thank you very much. A lot of hard work. Um, okay, our next uh, public comments are coming from Kathy and Jeff Keitel. Are you going to make two comments or one? Uh, two. Okay. So they each have three minutes. I am Kathy Keitel, and I live at 209 South Colorado Avenue, Buena Vista. Thank you for allowing for public comment. My concerns tonight are regarding sound pollution generated by the terrace on Main Street, located at 330 Main Street, Suite 200. The business website of the terrace indicates that the business was established in 2022 and is Buena Vista's first and only rooftop venue offering small bites and drinks. According to their booking website and now advertising themselves as a wedding venue starting in 2023, they had 16 wedding and or reception events in July and 14 events in August. Our home is one block directly south of the venue. Music funnels down our street, and when alcohol is involved, party go goers get loud, then the music gets louder, and then the people get louder. Last Friday night, it sounded like a cheering football stadium until about 11.30 p.m. As I walked down to take a video, of uh, the noise at 10 p.m., a neighbor came outside and asked what in the world is going on. My understanding is music should end at 10 p.m. <clears throat> this happens sometimes, or I should say most of the time, and there, but there have been several incidences of the music lasting beyond the 10 p.m. curfew. However, even when the music ends, the cheering, yelling, and clapping do not end, and they last well beyond the established curfew time. I understand businesses have rights, but do the rights of businesses trump the rights of citizens to a quiet and peaceful evening in their home? We have lived in our resident, current resident, for 35 years. And for the first time ever, our quality of life has been disrupted. The tarps that hang above the tables at the business are like a megaphone. So sound travels out and down the street instead of up into the air. I think in order for this issue to be resolved, there needs to be three considerations. One, a sound study. Two, a sound barrier on the south side of the building. And number three, a consideration by the council to carefully consider the neighborhoods and residences and the impact of these rooftop venues on the citizens of Buena Vista. Please reevaluate current guidelines and establish guidelines that don't impact the quality of life as we've known it. <clears throat> we have one rooftop venue right now, 
I understand there will be a second rooftop venue in the near future after the new construction of the Viking and the CKF, CKS building is completed. Precedence has already been established in Paris on Maine, but please put on the brakes and recognize the impact of rooftop venues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> I am Jeff Kyle, 209 South Colorado Avenue. And I'll just to support um, or concur with the comments that Kathy had, but also to think that we're at the end of the summer season. And uh, I think we have ample opportunity through the winter to resolve this, both from a regulatory standpoint and maybe also from a physical sound barrier standpoint. So uh, I think there's time to get this all resolved before um, you know the next summer season and um, we can get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So that concludes our public comment. Uh, Mayor, we do have one online. Oh yeah, please, I forgot online. Thank Jerry, you. can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. My name is uh, Jerry Rasky. I live at 10158 Starlight Lane in Salida, Colorado. And I'm here to talk about a new nonprofit called Hiccup that's focused on election integrity. Hiccup is a nonprofit whose aim it is to boost trust in the election process in Chafee County. The Secretary of State of Colorado calls Colorado's elections the gold standard, but like gold, the elections are opaque. Hiccup's mission promotes trust through transparency. Hiccup has been funded for the last three years, but the magnitude and the importance of our mission necessitates seeking external funding. Hiccup has begun its outreach program Speaking to you tonight, uh, the county commissioners, Slida City Council, Poncha Springs trustees, both political parties, and the League of Women Voters. Although Hiccup is a newly formed nonprofit, we've already been featured in local news articles who writes that uh, Hiccup's mission statement aligns with that of the League of Women Voters and that Hiccup's achievements have already resulted in improvements in the Chafee County election process. So I'd like to thank you for this public comment and follow up with an email to the trustees and the mayor where they can learn more about Hiccup and discuss further opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Now that concludes our public comment. Okay. Anyone else out there? <clears throat> so now we will go to our staff reports, <clears throat> beginning with new Dean Chief. Thank you, Mayor, Trustees. Um, several items to go over uh, briefly in my report. Um, let's see here. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge um, Chafee Fire. Um, we've been working closely with them. Um, we've had a couple of traffic crashes on the highway, which are um, um, can be a pretty dangerous thing. And um, I worked one with uh, Officer Mitchell last week, and Chafee Fire was there real quick, had a good response, good people, um, had a lot of cones out for um, our safety because there was a lot of traffic moving around. So um, just appreciate that uh, partnership with Chafee Fire. I wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, Monday is the community dinner, and uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, point out is we're going to have a company there called Meridian that um, is bringing some uh, special traffic barricades. Um, they did a demo for the town staff and the police department about a month ago. Um, really neat um, design, um, brings a lot of safety to public events. Um, there was a pretty good price tag with them. So um, as the trustees, if you're able to attend, um, take a look at these. Um, they're gonna have a, a rep there named Ian, really nice guy who can kind of talk about how they work and function. But I think it's something that, you know, in the past we've blocked off um, streets with cars and things like that, which is not always ideal. If that vehicle gets hit and it's kind of taken out of the, 
game in it that's expensive. So these barricades uh, provide a pretty good solution to some of that and they really help the public feel safe and provide a lot of safety. Um, we met with a company called Ajax on August 14th. We were looking at some uh, cameras and things for the schools and some software. Um, met with Sheriff Speezy and Chief Johnson for lunch on August 14th and we discussed some issues about uh, local law enforcement. Um, We've been working really close with Philip and Jana on the budget. That's my favorite time of year. <laughs> um, there's some photos later on. You'll see um, we did some active shooter training at the school. Um, Officer Mitchell and I were both instructors on that. So uh, we did some of that. And you can see in that picture on the right that we used our new training room, which we've actually used times over the past few weeks. So it's really nice. Um, really helps us a lot. So that was a solid training. Um, we had back to school night on August 22nd, and uh, that went real well. And um, let's see here. Oh, the school um, law enforcement partnership. I think that's an agenda item later on, so I'll talk about that then. Um, let's see. If you want to scroll up, Philip, I didn't. Oh, sorry, I was trying to get to your pictures. That's the best part. <clears throat> oh, yeah. We'll, we'll scroll down to the pictures here in a minute. Um, let's see. This is testing my eyesight. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got a sergeant opening we're testing for. Um, we've got two that started the academy in August that should be done in December. So that will really help out our staffing. Um, let's see, we attended a case law update held by the district attorney council on August 30th in Salida. That was really uh, educational. Um, we've been doing firearms training the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, and we had to put the school on a secure status on September 1st due to some bears that we're visiting. Um, also tomorrow um, at the River Park at three, we're doing our 9-11 our challenge uh, because that's uh, overlap day for us. We can't do it actually on 9-11, but that's where we uh, wear our tactical gear and we go up to the trestle bridge and back um, to honor um, all the firefighters and police that went into the uh, buildings um, and lost their lives on 9-11. And I want to acknowledge that and honor that. And I think some Chafee Fire guys are going to be joining us too with some bunker gear. So it should be a good time. And um, yes, I, yeah, if you want to scroll through the pictures now, that picture there with the people in the helicopter, the airport did their uh, high altitude fly in. So uh, Megan and Officer Flores mm -hmm. and Grant, they were trying to steal a helicopter, I think. <laughs> um, and then yeah, it's then at the first day of school, back to school night. And then um, the tactical vehicle that was funded um, earlier this year, you can see it there in the background. Um, that's in the county and they've already put it to use. They brought it to back to school night. And then there's, there's those two ruffians that ended up on the nature trip. <laughs> that's all I've got. I don't have to take any questions. Thank you, Chief. Does anyone have questions about the police department or how it's going in their new building? It's a nice building. It is a nice building. Yeah, now that we're moved in, it's not back by. Are things slowing down a little bit? Are some of your folks getting some vacation or not yet? Yeah, that started this week. So we're looking at a lot of holes on the schedule. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, it's well-deserved vacation. They worked hard this summer. And if you look at the, the overtime we've used, we. We burned through a lot of it, but it's it's summertime. It's it's the way the chips fall. So. Could could you say again um, the nine eleven event tomorrow? Is it tomorrow? Yeah, so we're going to meet at the river park at the bridge at three, and we go up to the Midland and then over to the old trestle bridge and back, and we wear our gear. And um, I don't see any problems. If any citizens want to join us, we're going to have uh, it's a. Uh, first responder event, but we're going to have some flags and stuff to represent like police and fire. And usually when we get there, we, we talk a little bit about 9-11, about how many people were killed. Um, I heard a sad statistic that because of the after effects of some of the things those guys and gals were exposed to, that it's almost equal um, to the people who died on 9-11, which is sad. Um, was, um, kind of memory lane for some of us is, you know, where were you on 9-11? And what do you remember? And, it's interesting. We've got some some new young officers that were, you know, wow. fathers when my mm -hmm. happened. So. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, now we have Mr. Benson. 
Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, trustees. My report is in the packet, page 64. Um, we have a new planning technician who started. I think that made it in there, Jamie Gray's, um, which is fantastic. We're getting some, um, some good training in and some permits process and some added organization, which is fantastic. Um, the planning zoning, we're still on the planner one, so we'll just see how that checks out. Um, planning zoning commission will meet next week. Um, moratorium, of course, expires next week, naturally, and, and I've got a list of minor subdivisions and some majors that are just waiting to, to come. So um, anticipate uh, a little more excitement. It's been a really slow planning department. Has not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got plenty to do, and we're going to have lots more to do pretty soon. So, which is great. Thank you again for the historic uh, designation of the Pearl Theater last meeting. And uh, just a reminder: um, next uh, next week on the twenty first uh, Thursday. Here at 5 p.m., there's a meeting with the Historic uh, Preservation Committee uh, Commission, excuse me, and um, uh, the certified local government group, and they're coming in to give a the result of a, a survey. They surveyed about 25 different properties on the west side of town, and so um, it's just a rundown of what those properties are and answering questions. So the property owners have been invited. Um, so anyone wants to come out? It's pretty interesting to see. Kind of that process and, and that would be the first step then for uh, if anyone wants to pursue historic des designation for those properties um, the additionally uh, hoping still to look at the comprehensive planning process just visiting the rfp to get that going uh, later this month um, so so that's on track um, and then we also updated building permits um, there's some still to update, but we broke it down. You see that through about as much, um, and these are multifamily or single family units, about as much activity before August as since August 1st. So, um, so getting, getting a good bit done. We've got a couple more to do in the queue, um, and then we're all cut up, which is great. Um, Development projects, I did include uh, some tables in there, table two, and I tried to break out major subdivisions that are in process. Again, trying to kind of keep the names of the, the subdivisions out because there's, you know, some, I can answer anything specifically, but you can see what the phase of development is. Um, and I tried to break it down, the number of units left to build, um, how many of those units may be some sort of workforce Housing again. There's no clear definition there, but a little less than you know, depending on the MI, et cetera. And then assumed SFEs. We also broke out some projects that have approached the town to one form or another, and some of these may not happen, and some might. Um, so that's in there just to get an idea of, of SFEs on the horizon potentially. Um, what we know might be workforce. And there's some question marks, of course. And then this last section, I, ha I haven't had a chance to to populate this, but I want to give an idea of what how many open building permits are out there, um, uh, the number of minor subdivisions under review, um, just so you guys have this general idea of what is what we're looking at. So, um, water. We'll talk uh, some in the executive session later, but um, I also put down uh, updated dashboard, changed things around a little bit and updated some things and, and um, tried to, um, you know, we've got, we've got that about 360 available, quote unquote. Um, and you can see the, the various buckets and the allocation of where things are. So, and that's it. If you have any, any questions, um, Please ask away. So in where you have the phase of development um, inquiry, <clears throat> inquiry two years ago, why would we even have that in there for two years ago? 
have they not pursued it since then? Correct. They've, they, and these, this category is really, they've just come and said, hey, oh, okay. I want to explore doing this. And we had some sort of a pre, pre-application meeting. And so we sat, visited, what, what are they going to have to do for this project? They, as far as we know, still on the property. Um, and things are just stalled out for, for them on that reason. And they haven't come back, but we still have it uh, kind of recorded just in case. Okay. Thank you. I have a, just to add with that, if they would come back, um, would we update them, obviously, and make sure they are familiar with where our new allocation process is? So if they do, okay. Just so kind of like in the article today, there's complete transparency so everybody knows where we're standing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, just going through it here at the phase of development, I'm not seeing, I know you didn't put all the development's names on there, but just double check on crossings. So is that under the needs final plat? Because that's the administrative approval on that or? Yeah, phase one is a final plat. So that's that one. This is need final plat for that. 150? Yeah. So that would not be included then in the 50 general development or the 52.8 in general development then? Um, at this point, no, because I haven't gone through final plat. So when they do the PIA, then that would, well, then we do 50. Um, yeah, uh, within the SFE count, that is not represented in the SFE. Because that would pretty much clear out the general development then, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, there's um, there are a few projects that, yeah, we're going to have to visit and talk about that at some point here. Okay. Cool. Just want to make sure. That, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, if none of those that are, um, well, the farm is executing, South Main is executing, the boulders are executing. Those are represented within the right SFE count, but none of it. And carbon is already included. Well, you have it here as its own line, but yeah. Okay. So thank you for um, circulating the Colorado Sun article. And it was a very good article, I thought. I want to congratulate you too for yep. making it clear in the article as to what it is we're trying to do with, with water allocations. And, I thought it was just very well, well explained. Thank you. And, I was it's, relieved. and it's creative. It came across. <laughs> <laughs> you never know how those things come across. Did you feel across. like it was, things were captured accurately? I do. Reported well. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And Joseph did a great job too. So yeah, thank you both. She, the, nice the, work. The, uh, it was a really honest attempt at talking about water and development, and combining those two. Yeah. I think they did. A, they did a good job. Good. I had the article sent to me from several several friends in different municipalities oh, yeah. around the state. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, there is when you're looking at this. Well. Yeah, well, it was really good. Any other uh, questions for Joel? Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. And now we have Sean Williams, Public Works Director. Hey. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Trustee. Um, yeah. Pretty, pretty, um, a lot, a lot going on in this report. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well-rounded report with a lot of different things that are happening right now. Uh, as, as always, uh, the August uh, production uh, information on that. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, had much success in getting our consultant back for leak detection. Um, we still have some goals, and we're still optimistic that you know we'll be able to do that. We just timing-wise has been challenging. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of busy people and our staff is pretty busy. So, but we're still planning on doing that. I mean, and it kind of looks, you know, fairly, fairly uh, reasonable, but, you know, given the amount of water that we produced in August, it's really, you know, if we would have made less water, the unaccounted would look much higher. So just to make that clear. So it helps. Um, the more we make, the less it looks. So anyways, but uh, it's still something that, uh, that we're um, challenging ourselves to get, get out in front of and, uh, and work on, um, through the rest of this year and next year if needed. Um, water plant expansion project. I think maybe we could maybe talk about this a little bit in <coughs> staff and trustee. I thought maybe at some point we were talking about maybe doing the field trip maybe in October. I'm not too sure. So I just kind of wanted to bring that up. Um, we're plugging away. We're working on uh, the Clearwell expansion. So a lot of masonry concrete work is going in right now. So we have uh, some holes in the ground that are uh, getting built up for, for part of our pretreatment uh, part of the um, water collection system for part of the phase of the project. So um, and 
going okay. We're a little behind schedule. We're working on that right now, though. Um, the upper tank recoding project is happening. So if anybody's driven up on um, County Road 306 near County 351, you'll see that our our contractors are up there working and uh, preparing for uh, for for new coat of paint on the tank. So that project is probably going to be um, be able to be completed on schedule, and that's October 16th. So um, just in time for yeah the weather changes that are happening. Uh, we'll circle back around with the water advisory board and see how the water conservation grant is progressing. Um, hopefully this month, um, well three is moving along, um, waiting for kind of irrigation seasons to, to wrap up to get uh, the, uh, the isolation and the power supply conversion done. And um, yeah, I'm waiting to hear back from Olson on the Arizona Bridge RMP advertisement package. We updated that. Uh, we were hoping to have that out, you know, probably this month to get advertised, but I'll have to check with Ben Groney with Olson to see where we're at with that. A few development constructing projects. I think I miss a few every once in a while. And it's, you know, just kind of wanted to kind of show the, the areas that are kind of impacting our team and the Bulger project. Um, they actually got the street open on Friday, reopened last week. They did a sewer main extension on Colorado Avenue. And they're looking to kind of wrap up their um, early grading permit phase of things. And so we're looking at the, um, um, the public uh, improvements um, OPCs, the costs in the, the, the phase of that project that was needed to be completed. So it looks like it's going pretty well. We just want to kind of verify some elevations and see what their plan is moving forward into the civil construction phases coming in where that would be putting in the water mains on site and sewer mains on site and starting to you know construct our roads and things like that. Um, <clears throat> farm phase two is um, is kind of wrapping up the big bulk of the phase. I think they've completed the concrete and phase and paving phases for the main uh, part of the of the, the loop that ties into it, the whole Antero Circle Apartments. There's still an apartment phase coming, part of that phase of projects and that hasn't been started yet, but the infrastructure's there now for that, that little phase to kind of get going or that smaller phase. Um, yeah, uh, speed up on West Main, um, trying to get that done. Um, wrapped up. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot going on. Hess Alberson is putting in uh, right now curb and gutter and, and sidewalks, and that's on Marquette Avenue. Um, kind of a big uh, little section of dirt road that needs constant uh, caressing. <laughs> Week goes by. Um, street projects. I don't know if you've had a chance to drive on, uh, get on Greg Drive or, or Rodeo Road, but those. Um, Chip seal projects are are done and complete. I thought that they came out pretty well. Um, real always happy with they want chip seal companies uh, finish work. Um, they do a great job of coming back and mitigating any issues throughout the year uh, if those come up. But um, they look like new roads. Uh, fortunately, um, EMS wants to cut through it right now to bring in power. But hey, we have a boring company up there, and I'm talking with Kyle with DSI to look at the strategy there. So I think we're gonna attempt that I, I just and they seem to be open to that quest as well so there's some uh utility uh, spectrum charters up in on greg drive and they're putting in um conduit for for expanding their their um communication services um, dsl things like that i imagine is what they're doing up there so they have a boring machine and we've already talked to them about putting in some conduits in for that project and they said yeah we could do that so looking forward to that um, I, I'm, I'm kind of up in the air right now a little bit on some of the street painting stuff that's going to come in. So we still have some striping to do on Greg Drive and on Rodeo Road. I've had a, a, one citizen reach out to Public Works and want to know if we could um, modify the bike lane that was on one side of Greg on Rodeo Road. So we just had it on the one side. I, I think we're going to need to put it back to the way it's engineered, the way it was done. They're, they're pretty narrow if you try to move two in on both sides and they don't have the width that we that we you know I think four foot is kind of the minimum and on top of that we kind of have a safe crossing right now on on where rodeo road meets west main street so i think we're going to you know kind of stop thinking about that and just go ahead and put it back in the way it was constructed originally i appreciate the feedback from the community and i understand there's some uh, 
some uh, different lenses on this and perspective that's worth spending a little bit of time looking at, but um, we'll be putting it back in the way it was. <laughs> okay, on the east side of the road? No, yeah, on the east side of the road, yeah. Um, yeah, we have we do have the the striping contractors coming in next week to do some milling for our thermal inlays for we're going to do some more thermal inlays for our crosswalks. So we have some locations where they're coming back in to do that work and then they'll follow up probably not next week, but the week after to come in and do the striping um, on Greg Drive, Rodeo Road and some of the other sites and locations that we had uh, paint, tech, paint needs in town. Um, uh, pretty, 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 um, uh, robust, hungry tree trimming RFP, but I just kind of wanted to share with everybody kind of the locations that we have identified. I don't know that we're, we're budgeted to do all of this work, but it looks like, um, we're pretty close to that. So, um, there's a few removals and a lot of trimming going on there. Um, I'll jump back into, I'll jump back up and talk just really quick about the Charles Street landscape project. That's the mini grant project. So we've done a little bit of work. Then we kind of looked at it and we did a little bit more work, but um, we have some boulder placements done. Um, we have our concrete um, scheduled for next week. So a uh, small little kind of patio gathering area, possibly for maybe, you know, multi-use or maybe just a bench and some sidewalks along the parking area. We'll have that done and then we'll wrap up the uh, kind of the rock and the landscape, the hardscaping that comes after that. So I really appreciate the parks team and, and their efforts. Um, to, it, it, I think it's going to look fantastic. I think there's a nice touch to it. Um, so so bear with us on this. Though, you know, it might not look like much right now, but I think once we get it all done, it's going to look fantastic. Um, pretty unique, I think. Um, anyway, so I'm really excited for that project. Um, and we're, you know, up across on the across the street there too, or the beautification advisory board had that little pocket park. So really, all we have to do is run in maybe one or two more rocks, but just put some edging in and and, and complete that project over there. Um, I'm going to jump to the end. I think. Um, oh, big big um, warm welcome to Jackie Cruick. She. Uh, filled our opening that we had for our cleaning service custodial. Um, and we're really happy with her. She's a great fit uh, for public works. And we've had uh, good feedback from our other departments. She's she's a hard worker and she's great to be around. And we're lucky to have picked up somebody that, you know, uh, to help us with that need. And so um, she's, she's been great. Um, just I'll, I'll follow up on the uh, the in kind donations a little bit more um, when we're when we get done with BB Strong. But um, gosh, I don't know how many years have we been doing this and and Terra Septic and waste management and Chippy Waste have been providing you know those services free of cost for that event. And just want to recognize that they're so great to work with and they're always eager to help out. <coughs> really appreciate them and. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing that they do. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a lot of time that takes them to do that. And uh, we, we generate a little bit of trash in that event. So um, I think the other kind of noteworthy item too, maybe we can save a little bit for traps, staff trustee interaction as well. So I've, uh, it's, a, it's a beautification advisory board um, request to uh, enter a contest for some uh, money to help beautify our dog park. And so I think I wanted a little bit of direction. I think I wanted to see if you needed a little bit more information, but if we talk about it in trustee staff and you support it at uh, the next meeting, maybe I'll bring you a little bit more information on the contest uh, rules and a, uh, um, a letter of support. So I'll end with that. Yeah, any questions? I have a little comment, just kind of actually tying into that, um, which I think would be great. So I'd love to find out more in the letter of support. Um, but time to that, I know that's been on their <coughs> to do list for a while to do something with the dog park, get it somewhere. So, I mean, as a dog owner, I'm talking to many dog owners, I think we're all very excited for something to happen over there. And, you know, so whether or not they get this grant, which I would hope they would, is there a timeline for some improvement? Um, so I kind of, I would love if we get an update from them or just kind of like what they can do to get done um, over there with the grant or without the grant. Cause I know it's been quite some time since I think anything has really been moving over there and speaking for 
quite a few dog owners I know are very excited for something to be improved and beautified over there. So, um, uh, yeah, so just to share that with you, sure. that would be, and, that would be I, great. Yeah, and I think, you know, budget season is upon us. And it's fairly long, if I remember right. I mean, it, it started, you know, months ago, right? Uh, but I know we have some uh, milestone dates for trustees and staff for, you know, presenting, you know, our projects. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can um, kind of strategize, you know, you know, I, I mean, a, a, it's a contest, right? So uh, there's only one winner. I don't know how many communities are entering and it's a nationwide <laughs> contest. So I think maybe we should have a, you know, some, I can maybe speak to some of it, Paula, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think part of the holdup has been liability concerns to a certain extent and costs. Like I think, like they've talked about um, wanting to do shading um, in the dog parks so as a place to sit, and uh, but to do one of those shades, since it's on town property or if the beautification puts it in, there's concern of if you don't put like large enough posts deep enough and wind picks up because it picks up here then it hits somebody and hurts somebody mm -hmm. there's concerns there so to do it right you really want to get like a backhoe in there which then means we have to tear down the fence to get everything in there and use the town's Chitty resources County. possibly yeah or? you know and we want to construct it to building code standards so we have wind load rating mm -hmm. um, uh, requirements so we want to make sure that we meet those and you're right you're absolutely right i mean we we could probably put something up there that would actually just fine but yeah for you know, we try to build things that meet our code and build things that last, right? And sure. So those are some challenges there. And then the other concern has to do with water, I think, because there's been some talk of getting water lines out there or something out there so you can have grass or have other vegetation. But if uh, this just sounds kind of ridiculous and my dog had these sports, but if there's water that the town supply in dog parks, a lot of dogs get sick because they drink the same water that the dogs get and they mm -hmm. drink the yeah. diseases. So then again, there's some liability concerns there that they'll be spreading diseases and blame the town. And so we don't want to bring water to the park mm -hmm. because it then opens up possibly some litigation. Mm -hmm. So that's another hold up. So there's been a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, potential purchases to improve it that I've been, I've missed a little past two unification meetings, but those are the conversations we have had. Um, and a lot of the holdups are like just a really quick idea that some brings forward the moment we run it through and talk with Sean or Allison's there like, well, there's actually a risk to bring that forward because mm. to do it right, it's going to cost a certain amount. We're backlogged on resource like town staff's already stretched thin and that's going to be pretty far. Sure. Cute. At least that was my understanding from some yeah. of the holdups. I think so. And I think like recognizing, you know, like the way we try to build our town, right? Um, smart ways to build things, um, street widths, you know, our investments to to maintain the the way our street designs are. I think, you know, our parks and our, you know, dog park and amenities like that are, I mean, I was I appreciate that consideration because I really appreciate that the uh, the advisory boards that participate with these projects are aware of that. And so I mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. You know, there are certain things, but there are probably some things that we could that we could provide, you know, amenity wise. I think we just there's just, you know, there's a lot, a lot of ways to go with this, right? mm -hmm. um, you know, but, uh, but, you know. I'm just doing my due diligence, said I'd ask and see where to go. <laughs> so people are excited for anything. So <laughs> just figured I'd put that out there. Thank you for the updates on, on that. Anything else for public works? Right. Yes, Andy. I have a couple of questions, Sean. It's kind of a popular topic these days with the tree trimming. Oh yeah. Can you? I have two questions about that. Can you speak to what is the, the driver for your tree trimming, pruning, and removal? Yeah, um, health of the trees and, you know, vulnerabilities. You know, I think, you know, a lot of what we, what we're looking at, if you look at the list, it's mostly cottonwoods, right? And th these trees are in right away. And they're in a town's right away. They're in town right away. They're our responsibility to maintain. Yeah. Do, do you expect a level of attention over your tree trimming activities that we've seen it with respect to the power lines? I don't know if I understand your question um, exactly. Um, uh, can you can you can you expand on that a little bit? Are you expecting any public relations challenges with your tree oh. project? No, I'm not. Why? <laughs> 
Um, I think because, you know, one, I, you know, I guess this is an ongoing maintenance program that, you know, we, we're, we provide to our community for, you know, uh, health and benefit and wellness of, you know, our community, our people, you know, the trees, you know, potentially becoming hazards, you know, where we find trees that maybe um, need to be removed because, you know, possibly, you know, they've reached their lifespan or maybe they're hollow inside. And, and, and because of that, you know, um, they're, they're definitely a hazard to our community or, or maybe a hazard, you know, if the wind blows. So, the tree advisory board and we have a little bit of help from you know some of the state forest <laughs> liaisons that we have and some of the people that help our you know participate with who are arborists and, and our staff that are that are arborists as well so you know these these trees are selected because they either have um, a, a canopy that needs some work or maybe they had bad trimming in the past or maybe the the tree is you know we're just trying to you know, keep the tree, you know, alive a little bit longer by removing um, top growth that that may be um, uh, no longer, uh, it's, they're dead branches and things like that. And so those are primarily the trees that we have on the list. And, and then some of the trees that we see that, mm -hmm. that maybe they have, you know, a lot of, you know, the the top growth uh, canopy that are that are um, that are dead or dying or, or evaluating over the years, and we see that it's regressing. Those trees become part of that removal list as well. So, um, but you know, I, yeah, I mean that's that's a good question, you know, because you know it's an interesting, you know, a different lens than mine, and I've always kind of seen that this is something that you know the town has been promoting for decades. And, uh, you know, and we've kind of put ourselves into um, this and some other places where, you know, now our investments need to become, you know, even more significant, you know, because there's a lot of work to do. And that's right away trees, you know, for, you know, uh, for the safety of our community. You know, so, it, yeah, it's an ongoing program. It is. Those are trees in a right of way and to some degree is hazard mitigation. Yeah. Thank you. If I may. They, Sean Seam also spent quite a bit of time building this plan with the tree advisory board input. So it's amazing what a plan will do <laughs> to mitigate concern. Community input. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you have a good plan. If I could jump back into the yeah, dog park thing, so I realize I oh. <laughs> didn't. I was going to say that. Um, I don't want to speak for a beautification committee, but I know that everybody there really wants to improve the dog park and it's top priority for some members in particular. So if you do know people in the community who want improvements and are talking about a lot about it, that then be more than happy to talk with folks who want to do a fundraising or drive or mm -hmm. something else that sure. I think they if they want to take part and also help them doing that. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, that has also been some beautification has talked about is a bit love more volunteers for people to have help with these this process. Totally. Not just the dog park, but other stuff too. But you know, if they do really want to, I think a key thing is raising money for it. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're really interested, put them in touch with some of the beautification. You know. You can totally do that. that. I'm sure they'd be interested. It seems like they're eager enough. So cool. that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else for public works? Sean. And now um, Kent, yeah, I see you're on your feet already and we'd like to hear from you about the fire department. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Kent Maxwell. I am the interim fire chief for Chief County Fire. Um, I have been um, a volunteer firefighter for 33 years. I served a dozen years as a station captain in Poncho Springs and the last seven years as a volunteer battalion chief. Um, I uh, also have Chestin Hart is our acting assistant chief. Um, so Chestin has been the county chief on <coughs> county um, for about the last, I believe, four years. Um, so we have both uh, transitioned into part-time paid staff for Chief of County Fire, um, which at the bottom of the um, bullet points there um, has uh, given rise to uh, and the issue that we're sorting through. So uh, a job um, is as president and fire and forestry coordinator for Colorado Fire Camp. Um, uh, 
501c3 nonprofit wildland firefighter school was started 20 years ago. Um, and that's um, where we do a lot of wildland firefighter training and wildfire mitigation, including the project that we did at North Pinewood Creek for Game Trail and Trail West. Um, so the transition for me to take this side hustle, I guess, as an interim fire chief, as so it is a, a public employee, runs into some statutory and constitutional issues on ethics and conflict of interest. Um, and so we're working our way through that and having, I spoke uh, with Bill Puckett um, a couple of days ago, or at least track, it's, it's been two weeks and it's been a long time. Um, and we'll work to, we're working up a, a, a plan to go through all of the issues, present it to the fire district's attorney, and then also share it with the town and, and then the town can also take another look at it um, just to see um, that we have that transparency um, as required by, by, by law and, and that we're not violating the public trust or the fiduciary duty. Um, otherwise, what we have going on is an expected hiring. So the second bullet point is the expected hiring. Um, permanent is probably not the right word. That's not the way um, things work. <laughs> In, uh, particularly in Colorado, where it's an uh, at-will state, and then also people can choose to, to seek other employment. So um, hiring a new chief, I'm not involved in that process. I've um, been asked to uh, apply for the position, um, which I may do. And so as part of that process, I can't be part of, of how the selection is done. Uh, Chest and heart would be the contact, so that if, if you have any questions about that hiring, um, they are working on outreach. Um, but, but as far as that part, um, that would be through either a board member for the fire district or through um, through a chief part. Um, third bullet point in there is the report from Fire Marshal Kira Jones um, with uh, 10 uh, commercial inspections uh, in the last month, uh, two short term rental inspections. Um, Working on some stuff on some commercial plan reviews and web meetings, I assume that that's, that workload is going to increase as the moratorium uh, lapses. Um, and then also um, working with the airport and, and some of the land that the town acquired that had a fire cistern under the county cistern requirements. Um, and so it's a need to maintain access to those and those need to be a plan to maintain those. So as the property owner, that's the, the responsibility of the town. And so Kira will be working through that with staff. Um, and then the fourth bullet point in there about the special events upcoming, what we have is the, uh, <coughs> the fire department is contracted to provide fire protection services for the uh, Billy Strings Renewal Festival. Um, and we're working through as part of our communication coming up kind of a theme of having an actual plan for how to coordinate all of the regular responsibilities we have as a fire protection district or obligations to the town of Buena Vista. Um, and then what we do when we're, we're staffing up to assist a special event um, or wildland deployments. And so the fire district does have a a uh, wildland program, um, not quite the same as the town of Buena Vista ran when it was the Buena Vista Fire Department, where it was predominantly um, extra personnel, reserve personnel that weren't part of the regular fire protection. Program. And so we need to balance that out. And we're, we're working to, to pull together a plan with that. Um, so otherwise, what we have is we have 10 staff, um, including myself and Chief Hart, uh, 10 career paid staff, excuse me, um, and we're hiring for an administrative assistant position. Uh, currently, we expect to fill that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, 25 volunteer firefighters, four resident firefighters that are housed in the newly remodeled uh, fire station number four in Poncho Springs, um, and an active recruitment Retention program working on um, a candidate academy coming up that may have as many as nine new, new firefighters in a candidate program. Two weeks in, uh, trying to balance with that sense of urgency, putting out all the little fires um, with patients as the transition goes through, that that's can that upheaval, <laughs> on staff. 
um, and so we're just being mindful of that, um, but trying to be responsive to the needs of the community, the needs of our, our agency partners. So I've been spending a fair amount of time driving around meeting um, uh, with agency partners. Uh, Chief Morgan and I have not yet met up for coffee, but it's in the, it's in the works. We did meet up on scene out there on that accident. Um, Highway 24. Um, and then the um, last things I'll have on there that are not part of the report is we have um, some preliminary discussions. I was unable to meet, attend the meeting, um, but the impacts that the increase in property valuations will have on the, the town's budget, and just trying to be mindful of that. So having that discussion as we go through that. 37% um, increase in the valuation within the town. Um, and so you haven't, your, your overall budget is not increasing by that, 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 that amount, is my understanding. So I'm going to work through that. Um, and then the last thing I'd add is that I am willing um, to assist um, the town with the, the Sanger de Cristo um, tree. Um, if you get through, into that where it becomes appropriate for my involvement, then I'd be glad to assist um, in terms of that mitigation. Um, is I think one of the last speakers at the public comment um, about community and that importance on community um, is, is what from my experience in doing a lot of fire prevention mitigation, um, that's a, you, it's not just about the trees, it's about the community. It's not just about the fire risk, it's about the community. Um, and slash disposal, what you're gonna actually do with what gets cut. And that's been an ongoing headache um, I've been doing that for about 20 some years. I might have something to add if, if, if you if you if you want if you desire the input. So um, questions? I think that that's all right. Yeah, yeah, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah, thanks for taking this on. Thank you. Oh well, we did um oh, yeah, we did. um Participated in a, a, an event with a representative, uh, Brittany Pedersen, um, the mayor, myself, uh, Keith Baker, um, and uh, the State Forest Service um, were there. Uh, had <coughs> maybe about 50 attendees. Um, that was, so was, that was Yeah, that was a, a useful <coughs> time. So thank you very much. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, that completes our staff reports. Um, I'd like to welcome Ashley uh, from the um, JP Housing Authority to give us an update on what you all are doing. <coughs> Thank you, welcome. Mayor. All right, sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Trustees. I'm Ashley Gapple. Um, I'm just going to provide a high-level overview tonight of some of our strategic initiatives. We just adopted a, the board had just adopted a new strategic plan at the last board meeting. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And, and both in the near term and then what's possible in the long term. So I think the theme here on this slide is really partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. That word is repeated several times. And we know we cannot solve this affordable housing crisis in Chief County without partnering with you all, the other jurisdictions, other stakeholders in the community, and, and just really working together on this. Um, so the first, there's four priority areas that we're focused on. And the first one is all of these are to be, the, the goal is for these to be achieved by the end of 2024. So this is like another year and a half, a little bit less than that. Um, the first priority outcome is set development, and we want to add 75 deed restricted rental units by building Jane's Place and leasing up Carbonate Street. Um, that will meet the needs of the 2022 housing needs assessment that the Chief Housing Authority put together um, at 13.6%. So that's our goal by the end of 2024. And then we also want to continue to partner with developers. Um, to create another 75 deed restricted rental units for construction to start within the next three years. So we already are in talks with, um, of course, the crossing, Paul Andrews, and 
we submitted two letters of intent for land banking under the Prop 123 land banking program. Um, the homestead is one of those projects. Um, the, there's a light tech de developer outside of Denver, in Denver that would come in and do 50 units of 30, 50, 60%, 80% AMI with one, two, and three bedroom unit mixes. That was one of the, the land banking applications we submitted. And the second one was Alpine West. Um, that's located just outside of Buena Vista in the county. Um, Alex Telhorst and, and, and the, the Chief Housing Authority, we've been working with him on that project for some time. Um, that land banking application was would be would include six workforce condos for the Chief Housing Trust. And as well as 24 need restricted rental apartments um, as well. <laughs> a couple other developers that we're talking to, but they're so preliminary that I'm not going to highlight those names right now. Um, priority outcomes to is education and advocacy focused. We really want to educate the community on what is possible and what we're doing. I feel like you all may be aware that we are not sure that everybody in the community is aware of the Chief Housing Authority that exists. We're a young organization. We really want to explain who we are and what we're, what we're capable of and what's the potential. Um, I think there's a lot of other mountain communities that we can learn from. And then I've been talking to those directors of those housing authorities. So that's one piece of that and you know providing updates like tonight is, is an example of that and i'd like to continue to do this every couple months if that would be okay with you all um there's a we are chafee documentary that the housing authorities in partnership we wrote a grant with um public health uh, county public health and so that documentary is explaining the crisis in affordable housing in chafee county I interviewed for that, just as Typhal did, and there's others in the community that have been interviewed, and that will be released in May. So that's pretty exciting um, to really shed light on, on, on what are some of the problems, but also what are the solutions. And we're really planning to do more writing in the paper and radio and reaching out to community members to really let them know what we can do for them. Um, some of the local policy, and advocacy work we've done so far this year. Um, we partnered with UC, the Community Foundation, and the Chafee Housing Trust. The four of us are partnering as the Chafee Housing Solutions Coalition. And um, one of the examples of the projects that we've worked on is in Salida. I'm sure you're familiar with the South Arc neighborhood. Um, it's a development that the, the town of, of the city of Salida is working on. There is an opportunity to build up to 400 units in that development. And um, really, the consultants prepared initially 250 units. And so one of the advocates that we worked with partnering together as a coalition to go and say, hey, let's let's build more units. And, and this would be deed restricted, a lot, about half of it would be deed restricted workforce and all of it would be workforce. And so it would really make a dent in the, in the, in the problem. And so through that effort, I mean, I think that there, this, the consultants have come back and the second iteration of the plan is now at 350 or 400, there's two plans. So we've, we're also potentially going to put, put, you know, continue to advocate for as many units as possible to solve the problem. Um, I'm working with the county planning on a possible amendment to the county land use code. This is very, very preliminary. It hasn't gone before planning commission or um, the county board of commissioners, but it would, you know, it would reduce the density requirements for ADUs in the county because there, there's one of that be one way that the county could help in and to solve the crisis and by adding some workforce housing and, and ADUs. Um, so, and priority outcome three, um, moving on to programming. So this is kind of in the reverse order. I'll take these at the, at the bottom first. Um, deepening the effectiveness of our continuum of care and rental deposit guarantee programs. Um, if you're not familiar with those, the, the continuum of care is really <coughs> men and members facing homelessness and housing insecurity. 
and accessing safe and stable housing and services that address their individual needs through a collaborative process. Um, it's a way for public service providers to collaboratively meet those needs. So it's like a wraparound services providing for people that are homeless in our community or are very are housing insecure. So over the past year, um, the, the continuum of care has served 94 individuals, 56 who are homeless and 38 who are housing insecure. Um, and we're expanding that to include um, a homeless outreach team for specifically families. We've just got a grant that will help pay for that and really to focus on making sure that families who are homeless have the needs that it is, but as many needs as they can to get met. Um, the rental deposit guarantee program is another grant that was received a couple years ago and it's a zero interest loan for security deposits. So when you're going to your tenant and you have to uh, last month's, first month's and security deposit, security deposit all at once, it's a lot. And so this provides the opportunity. We, we provide the security deposit, they pay it back over the course of their um, lease. So it's a revolving loan fund. Um, we're also working on with Salida's inclusionary housing program and of course carbon <coughs> on managing the deed restrictions um, for that program. And um, Jane's place is of course, once it gets built, it's a very complicated project. Um, that we want to get right. It's very, it's an unprecedented project and it has a homeless shelter, seasonal shelter for seasonal housing for seasonal workers, um, transitional housing, eight one bedrooms, two two bedrooms and two studios, plus a coffee shop for neurodivergent workers and a community nonprofit space all in one place in this very small four building you know, location. And so this is really an unprecedented project that we're taking on um, and, you know, getting it right in terms of all those different populations is really critical to have the right programming and the right um, culture manager in place to make sure that that is a good, makes it easy <coughs> that it takes off and is really successful. Um, and then our priority four outcome is funding. Um, you know, we can't solve this problem if we don't have money um, and a sustainable funding source for the organization. Um, the first tactic here is to create an aspirational budget. So we want to do it at three levels, baseline, um, ideal, and best case, so that we can really map out, hey, what can we do if we had this amount of funding, this amount of funding, or this amount of funding? And I'll speak to that at the end here, but you know we're really looking to secure a 10 year revenue stream for at least one to $2 million annually and there's a lot of ways that we could do that listed below. Um, of course, we are appreciative of, of the town of BD's um, intergovernmental agreement and commitment to the housing authority. And there's a there's a ballot initiative that we are contemplating special limited partnership program with Fading West and, and others that we can we can work, work with if we do other partnerships that's bringing in some revenue rent fee for services. Um, managing deed restrictions, for example, we should we need to be compensated for that work because it's taking time and, and energy and support and. Um, you know, so the property management fees once we have more property to manage. Uh, so the last slide is really looking to the future. Um, I am a little bit bold in putting this out there tonight. This is a, this is a different version than what's on that because it's evolving and, and I'm making an iteration of it as we speak. So what's on this, what's on this slide is similar to what I'm passing out, but what I'm passing out is a little bit different. Um, so this housing spectrum is sort of like, where can we go if we have, where are we today and where can we go? And so the, the, the green item, the green projects and programming are what we're doing now. The orange ones are what we're working to implement over the next year or two. And then 
the, the red ones are, hey, we could do so much more. And these are some programs that other Mountain communities are doing and um, we would like to bring to JP County. So of course, the spectrum is kind of obvious, but we wanna move from left to right on it. Um, and, and certainly one, one group of people that's not on this spectrum is seniors. I think that any new development that is developed should be um, include you know, wider doorways and have access for people to, you know, that, that, that'll be something that a senior citizen can live in. Um, so I'll start with programming. So I talked a little bit about our continuum of care. So you'll see that we have that in place, but I'd really like to expand it. We'd really like to explain it to the, to the, the right. Um, we have the Salida Open Door Project. That's a, a project that's five RVs, and um, we manage that project for the, that program for them. Um, it's like transitional housing for people that are experiencing housing insecurity. Um, the homeless outreach team is something we're working on for the families. And then the rapid rehousing would be a program related to the homeless that is, is funded by that grant that we just received for families that are homeless. And then financial literacy. I mean, we'd love to do something with this. I mean, just because you get a house doesn't mean you or, or, or become a tenant doesn't mean and you've been homeless, doesn't mean you know how to budget, doesn't mean you know um, what, and maybe some people have never had a bank account, believe it or not, or what understand what their credit score is and how to improve that. So that's what we really like to do. Um, we have the rental deposit guarantee program. We're beginning the deed restriction management program with Carpenter Street and um, the City of Slides Inclusionary Housing Program that requires developers to um, build a certain percentage of their project um, as deed restricted affordable housing and whether it's for rent or for sale. And then we look to the right and we, we want to get to some a, a home buyer. We want to get to a place where they can have down payment assistance, where we can educate them on the home buying process and what it means to um, <coughs> and, and, and you know, all the obligations and responsibilities that come with that. And then further along, if you're a homeowner and you already have a home, wouldn't it be nice if you could build a new EDU? And what if we could incentivize people with financial like rewards if they build an EDU and that was deed restricted for the community? And what about existing housing? There's programs in other uh, communities where they preserve existing housing and they, they give the, in exchange for 10% or 15% of the home value, they, they provide um, deed restricted, deed restriction and the housing authority manages that and it becomes part of their inventory for, for housing. And certainly buy downs, I mean, I don't know that we have enough inventory to do buy downs, um, but it is, it is another solution. And then the last piece of this is certainly development. Um, we already have the special partnerships program in place where we don't have to pay taxes for sales and property. And that's a benefit to them to incentivize them to partner with us. We do the same thing with the Chafee Housing Trust. Um, we have a partnership with them so they don't have to pay sales and property taxes. That helps them, that helps everybody. Um, some of the programs that are the development strategies that we don't have in place really, when we, we've applied for the letter, letter of intent for land banking, but we haven't really. Um, begun that program. I mean, we, we need to do more of that, um, get, have secure land so that we can entice developers to kind of build just like you all did with Carbonate Street. Um, adaptive reuse of motels and commercial use space. I mean, that we have some of those opportunities in this county um, where we potentially turn a hotel and our motel into you know, some studio efficiency apartments. Um, Partnerships with you all to hound schools, businesses. The US Forest Service even has a program where I've talked to them, um, potentially build on their land and do a lease. Which adds, so that's the opportunity that they're doing, I think, in Summit County right now, or maybe it's Eagle in Summit County. And then, of course, the, the Light Tech projects. So, in conclusion, um, happy to take any questions. I mean, the theme is partnerships. 
and, and working together as a community to solve this problem. And really the immediate strategic plan is exciting um, with the programming and development initiatives, initiatives, but then looking to the future long-term, we really need a strategy of like, how are we going to put a larger dent in this problem and solve it? And so that's kind of what this, this graphic is, is intended to, to show. Any questions? Yes. Hey, sorry to jump right on this one, but I just want to clarify. You said that one of the letters of intent was for the Homestead Project is 30, 50, and 60% AMI for rentals. Is that right? 50, 50 rental units, yes. Well, 50, what was the AMI <laughs> that you were? 30, 50, 60, and 80. Oh, okay. For 50 units. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be an amazing project but to have that come to fruition. Uh, when on uh, priority outcome four, where you say that you'd like to secure a 10 year revenue stream of one to 2 million annually, what kind of a budget would that lead you into? Would it be the baseline or the ideal or best case type budget? Um, I think, you know, I mean, best case is probably more like 5 million, but the ideal would be one to 2 million, I think. So we'd be, talking about that level of uh, commitment at that point. And can you, can you say um, what you're thinking about in terms of getting on the ballot again? Um, I mean, it's, it's still very preliminary in terms of the board has not committed to that. It's definitely something that we're thinking about, but it isn't something that the board has approved or um, made any firm commitments with. I have talked to um, a political strategist group that did a ballot initiative together with the town of Vail in 2021 successfully and the a ballot initiative with Fraser River Valley in 2022 successfully and they were off by one percentage point in terms of their polling and so you know if we're going to do this we would definitely want to do it right this time. Um, to make sure that it's going to pass. So we do a survey um, of the community, a very broad survey that they would conduct, potentially what proves this. Um, but, you know, we need to make sure we're listening and making sure that this is something that the community wants. But I know that housing is something the community wants. It's just a matter of people are willing to pay for it. Yeah, that's always the big question is who's who's going to pay for it. But this seems like a hazardous year to me. No, this would be for 2024. We won't do it this year. Yeah. Okay. Now, other questions? Comments? This was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, really good job. Yeah, I really like the diverse level of program that you're trying mm -hmm. to do. Like financial literacy, which I think is... Yeah. Huge. Like, I mean, I've been, definitely been in a place where I couldn't get the down payment, or not down payment, I mean, security deposit in the apartment and right. help people get from that point to potentially even owning a home one day. Uh, right. Just you didn't know what steps you need to make. So, yeah, not really good things here. Counseling. Yeah. I have one other question. Um, sure. For you or anybody else here, does anyone have any idea how, how many? homeless families or individuals we have here in the north part of the county? You know, I, I know that that is one thing that we want to, that we're going to expand on because we hired somebody for the, under the grant, the, the Bezos grant that we received um, July that will be working specifically on that homeless for families. And we'd like to expand it to be homeless for individuals as well, but that program is specifically for families. So we recognize that we haven't done as good a job at the north end of the county, but she will be, Trisha will be coming up here um, at least twice a month to do outreach at the um, different, you know, I think there's some community services that are provided and she'll be there to um, meet with individuals that are experiencing homelessness and I can potentially give you a better number I mean I know 94 is who we've served I do recognize that a lot of the 
friend in the, in the south of the county because that's where a lot of the services are, right? And so we definitely recognize we need to do a better job of being in the north end of the county. Chief, do you ever get a feel for how many homeless people we, we have here? Yeah, um, we have a handful that are here year round. Um, a couple of them, I think, by choice. Um, it seems like we get an influx of transient type things in the in the summertime. Um, but colder weather, sometimes people move somewhere warmer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's not, I haven't seen like with our officers, like it, it's um, too burdensome as far as, you know, finding places for them. But I, I do recall some years where, you know, it's been freezing temperatures and we've had people um, with nowhere to stay, you know, icicles in their beards and things. And I remember officers, you know, with their own money, buying them gloves and hats and mm -hmm. trying to help them. Um, one of the difficulties we've encountered too is um, some of the motels, it's a challenge sometimes to take some of, the, some of these people in because um, sometimes they're homeless because there's a, a mental health issue or a drug problem. And I remember once, this is probably about eight or nine years ago, an officer actually bought a motel room for one of these individuals and they immediately started smoking marijuana, burned the, the sheets and stuff. And the motel was like, we never do that again. So it's, it's a challenge. It's like, when we have that issue, what do we do with them to help them, especially when it's so cold out? Um, so definitely an issue to tackle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else have an idea? I, I don't personally, no. Okay, well, thank you, Ashley. Appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, we are um, going to talk about the schools and the uh, um, officers in the school. And I think that uh, Dean Morgan, you're going to speak with us about this. Is that right? Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. Has everyone had an opportunity to read the IGA? Um, I'm uh, excited about the direction of this program. Um, I'm happy to speak to the, the rhyme and reason about why we're changing some things up. We work pretty close with the school on developing this. Um, so I think maybe the best use of time might be to just um, see what questions you might have about it and how I can help explain things if, if that's necessary. And just kind of level set, um, just to provide a little bit of history, the, the, the origin of this was in 2018 when we created a SRO program, School Resource Officer Program. Um, we did have uh, an amendment in 2022, I believe, is what I put in there, yes. Um, and so this is a totally new iteration of this. It's replacing the existing IGA um, with a different, a slightly different approach uh, to it that uh, primarily Dean and Lisa Yates have been working together on over the last several months. Um, Jeff and I have looked over this and provided input and everything, but um, as Dean said, it's, it, it's kind of a step in good direction uh, from our perspective, and certainly from the schools as well, but yeah, I want to make sure you all understand it. Um, the school is going to be doing quite a bit of communication out about different terminology, different people involved, things like that and why. So they're they're focusing on communicating to their constituents as well on this, because we know this is important to the community. Uh, but uh, yeah, as Dean said, probably take any questions you might have about it. How does it differ from the SRO program? Yeah, so the SRO program was a dedicated officer, uh, the school resource officer. And that was one officer that was um, tasked with covering the, the different schools we have in town. Primarily, we partnered with the public school, but we also give consideration to some of the other schools like Darren Patterson Christian Academy it was also the Montessori school. So we're going to give thought to school safety across the spectrum to all the schools in town, regardless on whether or not there's a school resource officer. So some of those services that you know, we undertake as a police department, whether or not there's an SRO program, um, we train the schools on the active shooter response, um, lockdown protocols, things like that. 
Um, one of the benefits of, of a dedicated SRO program is they're really designed to help build trust between youth and police. And so we're looking at all these different angles. And one of the things is in, in Buena Vista, we're a smaller town than the city, so, uh, than the Front Range cities where you might be able to have an SRO in every school. Um, ideally, I think that would be nice if we could have an SRO in every school, but I just don't think that's a reality in small towns. Um, Salida is pretty similar. They have several schools in town, but still one SRO. So I think one of the uh, issues we want to look at is responsiveness, is if something really dangerous were to happen at one of the schools, what's the police response going to look like? Um, the other aspect is, like I mentioned, building trust with um, youth. So when we had the last few years uh, dedicated SRO, their office was um, in the high school. They were on that campus a lot, but we also want to consider Avery Parsons Elementary, the Grove Preschool. Um, so that officer would often travel back and forth. Um, the school district itself, I don't want to speak too much on their behalf, but I know um, we've talked that it's important that the school has some partnering with the program by providing some money toward it. And as the years have gone on, they've been able to provide less and less, which I understand. Um, but we still want to provide the same level of service regardless, because it's about protecting the, the kids and staff there. So um, I was kind of stressed out over the summer trying to figure out how we were going to fill the SRO position, because the two we've had um, they were ready to move on and in their law enforcement career to some other things. And we didn't really have anybody that wanted to be a full-time school resource officer. So I talked with Lisa and um, she came up with the idea initially of, of a school partnership where she recognized there's things going on in town where sometimes we only have one or two officers on and that school resource officer is sitting there at the school with maybe nothing going on. And it's like, we have, sometimes we've had to pull that resource out of the school and say, hey, we need you out on the street to help with, you know, whatever's happening. So um, the idea with the school partnership program is we're going to assign a coordinator. And years ago, you may remember when there was in um, California, the, the Bank of America robbery at North Hollywood. Um, one of the big things that came out of that was the patrol officers were in this 44 minute gun battle and it took SWAT a long time to get there before they were able to stop what was happening, 44 minutes. So LAPD, which is a pretty proactive department, they developed what they called SWAT on patrol where they started teaching SWAT tactics to patrol officers. And I, I discussed this with Lisa Yates, that kind of came to mind the idea of what if we started um, treating each of our officers like an SRO and kind of coming up with a team of officers that are kind of dedicated to SRO duties. So what it looks like now under this program is we have one officer who's going to coordinate it because it does need some coordination. And um, we uh, did a testing process for that. And Officer Flores um, was selected. Um, she was an SRO down in uh, Texas before she came here really good with uh, the staff and students. The, the other thing to consider with uh, school programs, <coughs> going <coughs> pregnant on too much, but- That was fascinating. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Helpful. yeah. yeah well, one of the things to consider was um, schools like roughly eight hours a day, but school security um, goes above and beyond that. Um, you may recall that recently there was a school shooting in Oklahoma at a football game. So the schools told us, they're like, we're pretty concerned about safety of things happening after school, at sporting events, at football games. So having a dedicated SRO that's, you know, eight in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon, how do we handle the homecoming dance? How do we handle prom? How do we handle football games? So in the past, we've just kind of, you know, taken a night car or scheduled an extra car and say, hey, can you hang out at the game? you know, and, and cover this or hang out at the dance for overtime. Um, so with this program, Officer Flores, she'll be able to coordinate it where the school is going to ask for certain services every month, like up to five. And um, they'll say, hey, we need an officer at this game or we need an officer at the homecoming dance. 
Um, and then throughout the day, officers, while they're patrolling throughout town, they're just gonna stop in at the schools, check doors, do walkthroughs, interact with the kids. Um, that's how I started my day. It's actually a pretty good way to start the day. I came on at 10 today because this meeting, I figured I'd be here a little late. So mm -hmm. I just went over to the schools. I walked through the hallways. I mean, that's the best thing to go to the elementary school where all the kids, they think you're Superman. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. And then the, the staff loves to see us there. One of the strengths of patrol is that it's random. So nobody knows when a cop's going to walk around the corner. Um, so that provides, I think, a level of security. Um, Fraser Pomfret, the, our canine officer, he was on today with me, so he did some walkthroughs. So there's officers going in and out of the schools all the time. And then we're assigned special events like games and things like that. And we keep a log of everything we're doing. And, and just the first week, we filled up a log sheet. And, and one day, um, we had a, a student that was a runaway or didn't ended up not getting on the school bus that we helped them with. We had um, some criminal activity that the school called us and we helped them with. So kind of doing the same things at the SRO, but I think spreading it out a little more so it's um, better utilization of the officers. And um, I think that kind of sums it up. Um, did, does that explain it? Does that kind of in a better picture? Those sound. Um... It sounds better. It sounds better for the children and for the officers as well. Yeah, and one of the things is um, there's a association called the National Association of School Resource Officers. So the coordinator, um, <laughs> Megan, who's been our school resource officer, she's been to the Nazro schools, the um, National Association, and um, so we're going to send um, Officer Flores to that. It's a forty week or forty week, <laughs> forty hour school. We're also going to send her to active shooter instructor school so she can help um, do uh, threat assessments and things at the schools. And one of the things NASRO teaches is they call it the triad, where there's three things a school resource officer should do. Um, and it's to um, act as a uh, informal counselor with students, um, which we've encountered a lot, um, where, you know, maybe a female student's having an issue with her boyfriend or something. <coughs> They've gone to Megan, you know, someone they feel comfortable talking to. So we're still going to have that dynamic also as an educator. So it's not uncommon at all for the staff to ask the SROs to come in and talk about um, like the Bill of Rights um, for some of the kids that are driving. Like, hey, if you get stopped by the police, what are some things you should or should not do? Um, They've had baking contests where they have us come in and help judge their food and stuff. It's, it's pretty <laughs> fun. Duty. Yeah. yeah, I got a good picture of Megan. They made a, a pancake for her shaped like a gun and then the whipped cream was smoke. So that was really good <laughs> pancake. But, um, and then the, the last thing is, is, is law enforcement. And I know we discussed earlier this year, uh, things like the vaping ordinance, which we've already had some issues with that. And there's gonna be times where the uh, officer has to enforce the law because, you know, breaking <clears throat> school property so this should encapsulate all of that and I feel good about it moving forward that's creative thank you professor any comments on this sir you're looking for us to um, approve the ordinance is that uh, resolution. Resolution. Yeah. What is res resolution number 65? It's on page 80 of your packet. We'll make a motion to approve resolution number 65, series 2023. Second. So we have Lucati and Rice. And, um, I think I'll roll call on this. Sorry, my voice is going me. <coughs> Trustee Cobb. Yes. Trustee Hilton Hinga. Yes. Trustee Lucrezzi. Yes. Trustee Rice. Yes. Trustee Swisher. Yes. And Trustee Rowe. Yes. Thank you all. Great job, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the school board will be looking at this at their next meeting on the 25th, which uh, Dean and I'll be attending Brian, Dragon Brian, and <laughs> as well. Um, 
it's an annual meeting we have with the school board just talking about programs like this so they'll be approving it as well yeah this work okay philip you are going to speak with us i think about XO energy uh easement <laughs> See. Yes. So on page 90 of your packet uh, is a memo summarizing uh, what's before you tonight, which is a revised proposal from Excel Energy. Um, this, if you may not remember, it's been, it feels like it's been a long time ago, but back early, earlier this year in January, this was brought before the board for discussion. Um, Excel Energy is replacing their large lines that actually start on the town's dry field property and goes north up towards Leadville. And um, they've been pursuing um, some, some easement, some, some space to, to conduct that work. Um, we have an existing easement through the property uh, that right now has a 75 foot wide, um, kind of cuts through north south uh, of the property and um, so in looking at that they are requesting to expand or blow out that easement um, mm -hmm. consuming about another two acres of property um, uh, and so they that's that's been a part of the uh, discussion that provides them with enough space to access those lines for replacement and ongoing maintenance um, in addition to that, they have been talking about um, temporary construction easement. Again, uh, the lines uh, line work sort of starts on our property, and uh, the way it's been described to us, they, they have equipment set up where they, they kind of stretch the lines and then they go over the new poles. And so they'll have equipment in place um, to hold the lines in place. So that, uh, that is what is referred to as the temporary construction easement. And then um, access to that will be necessary on a, on a fairly regular basis during the construction phase of this project. So initially this was presented as a permanent easement that was going from the highway uh, across the dirt, existing dirt road um, and then up uh, towards where their where their existing easement is, where the lines are. Uh, staff has negotiated out of that, uh, away from a permanent easement. They have the right to access that easement, but it, um, they have to notify the property owner when they do that. So there's some coordination on getting onto the property or across our property. We felt that was more more appropriate than um, adding a permanent easement. Um, so they have uh, conceded to that, and so that's referred to as a temporary access easement. Uh, that is requested for a two-year duration to cover the span of time for the construction project. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, they are compensating for uh, both for the restated easement, the blowout easement, um, that is along their lines and for the temporary construction and temporary access easements uh, you can see there plus some additional payment for towns uh, review and <laughs> execution uh, of these various aspects of the, of the proposal um, finally there is a letter agreement a side agreement um, that um, reiterates the need for restoration of any damages to the ground from this work. Um, they are bound by that already, but that was a priority that was identified by the board back in January and staff uh, agreed with that. So um, that side agreement would be executed at the same time as the rest of this. And, and again, it just explicit, explicitly talks about uh, repairing soils and things like that, anything that has been disrupted during the time of construction. Uh, with this, there's a there's a map here just for reference. I probably should have pointed at this so it makes a little bit more sense. But uh, and they changed Adobe changed their setup here, so I don't have the normal buttons. But uh, bear with me here. So 
This is the dry field property, Highway 24, right here, north south. Here's our, our uh, access road. The existing house and ADU are right here. Uh, this dirt uh, road turns up and goes to a couple of other properties uh, to the west. So you can see here the existing lines are the purple and green. The temporary construction easement is right here in the shaded area. And then the temporary construction access or temporary access easement is this, this uh, red line essentially that gets them up into this area where their poles will be replaced. Uh, so uh, we do have uh, Russell uh, online, I believe, uh, if there are any questions to Excel, but this has been poured over quite a bit over the last several months. I, I think there was a pretty good discussion last time, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, you have related to this. No questions from trustees? No, but I have a comment. I would love a tour of Dreadfield, the okay. farm at some point, if maybe yeah. that's one place I haven't been. And I don't know if anybody else yeah. has been up there, but no, no I'm sorry. Related, not related, not related. Yeah. since we're on the topic. <laughs> Next week, Brian starts. I think we can, <laughs> right? we can start need, scheduling. You'll need things. to see it too, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're right. No, we'd love to do that. It's a great spot. Thank you. So we're looking for a motion to approve, approve with amendments or deny the attached um, revised offer to amend the easement and for temporary construction easement. I so move. Okay. Second. We have Cobb and Swisher. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Okay, so the last uh, business item is the um, is a budget amendment for Carbonate Street condemned property deposit. So it's a little triangle of land. It's a hard hard one to word not to yeah. draw too much attention to hear <laughs> people um, about that, but uh, yes. Yeah, so so this one I wanted to bring forward to the board as a consideration to amend the budget. <laughs> Uh, essentially, what has what has occurred is uh, uh, Joseph Teichel led this project with legal. Um, there's a triangle parcel of land that has always been considered as town property. It is included in the design or the the scope of Phase Two of Carbonate Street. Before we can move forward with that, we needed to uh, go through a process of uh, uh, getting a clear title. Uh, that required a condemnation of the property, which uh, was, a, was an extensive process to make sure that there was no uh, claims uh, besides the town to the property. Uh, that, has con that stage has concluded. And in your packet, I included the uh, district court uh, affidavit, but, but the finding of what the value of that property is because the next stage is the town has to put a deposit to the court to hold for a year uh, in case during that time anyone does come forward with a valid claim of ownership. They essentially, I guess, if they go through a process of proving ownership, they will receive those funds. Uh, the other aspect to this is it doesn't seem that there's a guarantee that we will get that deposit back. Uh, some nifty thing that the state can do about holding and keeping those funds. And <laughs> Jeff is online and can speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll, we will definitely make every attempt to get that money back at the end of one year. Um, this $18,125.10 uh, would come out of the general fund, fund balance. Um, about half of that could be considered ARPA funding if we don't get it back. And have remaining ARPA funds from COVID relief, um, but uh, yeah, kind of a necessary step for us to take so that we can move forward with phase two planning. And Jeff, if there's anything that I missed on, you, you stole my thunder. You, you covered it perfectly, better than I could have. I mean, ultimately, 
the basic rule is when you acquire property, you need to pay fair market value for it. And when there is nobody who's claiming ownership of the property, you still have to do that. And the real question where there's a bit of a um, difference of opinion among the various courts in Colorado was whether um, the, the condemning party gets the money back if nobody shows up in the next year or whether it's actually money that belongs to the state and goes into a state fund. And so at the end of the year, we'll try and get it back. But I, I think Philip said that there's no guarantees we can. So we'll do our best for you. Sounds like a fee, not a deposit. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's basically the fair market value amount that you would have had to pay had there been somebody who was actually owning the property that you were taking it from. The state gets that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The house always wins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not always, not always. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, basically, you want to get our approval to put that into the 2023 budget adjustment that'll take place later. Correct. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to that effect? I'll make that motion. Second. Okay. And um, Paula, do you have a wording for the motion? I have moved to approve amending the 2023 budget to pay $18,125.10 as a deposit to the court upon final ruling of the condemned triangle parcel that is part of the Carbonate Street Phase 2. After one year, the town will attempt to recover the deposit if no other person or entity claims ownership. Let's say you have the wording. <laughs> oh, that may be one of the last one, and I can copy it pretty <laughs> <laughs> Should we take out the last part? Because we're really approving it as 18,000, right? I mean, regardless of the second sentence there, which was, we'll try to get it back. Doesn't matter to you. I don't. Doesn't matter to me because we we will okay. we will attempt to get it back. Okay. Is there a second? That's right. Mm -hmm. Second from Peter. So we have Swisher and and Hilp Hinga. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. So now we are at the. Um, Trustee staff interaction. And I would say we should do this and then we'll um, have a vote to go into an executive session and take a little break before we do that. So, um, Andrew, you have anything you'd like to talk about with this? Andy? You? Okay. Well, they have the Apple Fest, and Apple Fest is always a good thing. And you had a run this weekend. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So we're still doing lots of stuff on the weekends. So keeps the police department busy. And yeah. I'm going to be at that run, though. Yeah. The autumn run? Oh, the autumn oh, the run. Autumn is coming, coming, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're going to join me, Sean? <laughs> so, um, I want to. Uh, I actually have a couple things. I wanted to go back to the couple of public comments one from uh, the Keitels and then the one from Alan Robinson and just see what folks think. Um, I think Sean had a couple of things he wanted us to try to take up, but I'll let him raise those the dog park and the water field trip or something like that. And then I also just wanted to thank Philip for. I know you still have a time to go to overlap with Brian, but thank you so much for keeping us whole through this time with uh, Joel and you know the rest of the staff. And uh, just uh, I know it's been uh, you know been very short-handed, and I uh, just appreciate all that you all have accomplished. And that I really appreciate your standing in again. Well, thank you very much. I hope this for your sake is the last time you have to do that. It's been a good run. Been <laughs> a good summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Thanks, Sarah. Um, but did we want to talk about the or, or what we can do about the noise issue and also whether we want to 
whether it's appropriate for us to discuss whether we want to or decide whether we want to try to support uh, Alan Robinson's request. Yeah. Oh, we've gotten close before on, on uh, talking about this sound issue. And it's really actually harder than you think to, to um, <clears throat> declare that something is a, is a nuisance sound. And um, specifically, I think right now, our, our uh, municipal code basically has, requires that a police officer be able to hold a decibel reader um, and get a constant 10 minutes of sound uh, before it's considered a violation. And if you think about how sound is or bands are, you know, it's not, you don't really get 10 minutes of just solid sound necessarily. You're going to get, you know, five minutes, a little 20 second break, and then a new song starts up. And um, so it's really, it may be harder than we think to be able to, to um, you know, to really regulate that. On the other hand, you got to do something, you know. Mm -hmm must be some kind of hours that we could, uh, you know, put in there. Well, I think that's part of the thing, isn't it? Isn't that they're not allowed to have music or anything after 10 o'clock? No, so let's let's clarify that because that's a that's a mis misstatement from our code. So in chapter seven, it describes um, all about noise and what, what constitutes a nuisance, what's excluded from that, how it's measured. So some good light reading. Um, but there's no 10 o'clock curfew. There's no oh, such really? thing okay. as that in our code. So um, there are uh, decibel limits uh, in the code uh, that's broken out by kind of zone districts, not specific zone districts, but residential, commercial, things like that. Three, I think there's three categories there. Um, and then there's a difference between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then after 7 p.m. back to 7 a.m. Those decibel limits go down after 7 p.m. Essentially, was there anything in their actual business license or liquor license or anything like that? that nope, there's okay. nothing about them that's unique or different or, or permitted. Um, there's there's the concept of special permits, things happening on town property, <laughs> parks, being our streets, you know, things like that, and then that gives town administration the ability to to permit exceptions to the code um, for certain periods of time, certain conditions, things like that. So there is no, there's nothing special that the terrace has that's for amplified sound or time limits or anything like that. Uh, so really it comes down to how much uh, noise is being created and then from a property that is complaining it about it as a nuisance, if they call the police and police officers, code enforcement, whatever, can measure it and, it and it violates that code, then it becomes a nuisance they can act on. Otherwise, it, it's a community discussion about what is, what is a, a, a nuisance when it comes to noise and, and are there other conditions that the board's interested in pursuing on top of that or uh, you know, instead of how our code is currently written. We did spend quite a bit of time a year or two ago, something like that. Grant organized some codes and some examples from other municipalities. Um, we, we, yeah, Joel was part of that too. We had some discussion and quickly realized like there is, there's not a lot of great codes out there. And Jeff would probably uh, share as well that it's, it's a very challenging thing to deal with in terms of code. Uh, you know, the town really has a very clear vision of like, we do not want X, Y, and Z and that we can pursue something clear cut like that. Otherwise we are kind of left to trying to measure the sound as a nuisance. Um, and you don't want to go too far the other way because then we're going to be nitpicking a lot of noise that does exist. The Dean has a great example of, Measuring it a few years ago, somebody was complaining about noise coming from um, a special or a permitted event. And he was picking up the sound from McFellamy Park. The, the waterfall was exceeding the code um, where he was standing. So it, it's a challenge, but certainly recognize and empathize with the concerns that were mentioned tonight. 
Um, so I think staff is definitely open to discussion, but um, we didn't pursue any code changes back then because we realized that we might open up unintended consequences and there really was no clear direction from the board about what they wanted or didn't want on Main Street specifically, because I think that's where most of this originates mm -hmm. and concerns com and, and uh, complaints. So, Jeff, do you have any ideas on, on this? Yeah, this is one of my, uh, I, I've been doing this full law for 20 years. I mean, a lawyer for 30 years and I haven't come up with a good solution yet. You know, noise issues are real tricky. Um, I had another jurisdiction dealing with one just a month ago and I don't have a great answer. I mean, you're supposed, to, just as a note, those decibel limits in your code, they actually mirror state statute nuisance noise decibel limits. And so, you know, if those limits aren't reasonable for the area, you could change them, you could lower them. Part of the problem, you could change the hours that they apply. And, you know, part of the problem Philip pointed out is that, you know, there are other things that make noise and then you want to make sure you're not making them too low or else, you know, everything is going to start to violate that code. Um, I don't have a great solution. Uh, I just tell you that this is one of those issues that it's difficult. I think really what happens is you have to enforce it against sort of the most extreme obvious cases where there's major problems. Um, and it's pretty easy to prove a violation. Um, the other solution is community-based where you have to work with the different property owners, um, trying to get them to use reasonable measures not to disturb their neighbors. Um, you, know, you could put in you know, no outdoor music, no amplified music at these hours. You could you know, have all kinds of other restrictions in place that would just prohibit certain types of noise altogether that might have an impact, but you'd have to think about how that would work in different areas. And it could be, you know, zone district to zone district or area to area in the city. So there are ways to try and get a little more precise and address the issue a little more, in a little more detailed fashion, but I, I tell you, it's difficult. So uh, if you try to deal with one issue, then, you know, you gotta make sure you're thinking about the ramifications on another, on other uses that could be a problem. So. I don't have a great answer for you, but I'm certainly happy to sit down and staff and try and think about workable options. Mm -hmm. Chief, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, I, I would submit that um, right off the bat, the uh, the town's municipal code online is a really good resource um, to get some public education on this. Um, if you just go to it and you can just type in the search bar noise, and there's quite a few different noise ordinances related to vehicle noise, construction noise, but specific to this, it's 7 163 excessive noise prohibited. Um, I could pass this around if you want, but it's got the little chart as to what the decibel levels are. Um, but it does, and also it, it talks about the zones. Um, so certain zones, like where the terrace is, <clears throat> excuse me, is considered a commercial. So there's different levels for commercial. Um, the case Philip was talking about, the, the restaurant had an outdoor live band um, and it immediately started generating noise complaints. Um, people came to the board. Um, I think some of you may have been a trustee at, at that time. Um, and so we, I think the decision at the time was made that that restaurant was given a special event permit to go to 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, their band needed to stop. And that seemed to be okay with the uh, um, the people that lived in the area. That place, if you'll notice, it was in this purple zone and it backed right up to residential neighborhoods, which was kind of an interesting dynamic. Um, but that seemed to kind of resolve it that summer. And then that business since then hasn't had outdoor bands. So that's what the council did at that time is they gave a noise permit for like Saturday nights to that business. Um, so maybe that's where the 10 o'clock thing's coming from in some people's minds. Mm -hmm. But like Philip said, um, it, it addresses it in the code. And that's what we use as our rule if we're going to enforce it from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Those are the hours that we look at. Um, it does say that it can be um, music that occurs or noise for 10 or more minutes. But it's kind of a little bit weird. And then it says, or and it gives some other examples. And one of these, it says, or be measured at a point or points along the property line and closing the property on which the noise source is located. And as I interpret that, 
For example, at the terrace, an officer would stand on the property line measure, and if it's over, then it's a violation. Even if it doesn't go 10 minutes. Um, Correct. Yeah. And, yeah, that would make sense. So, and that's something we may need to revisit some of this, but on our end, um, it's not a nuisance unless somebody complains about it, which we have. Um, and then for us, we prioritize, you know, um, crimes against people, property, and nuisance. So if we're busy with other things, we're probably not even going to be able to respond. And in the summertime, you know, and like Jeff said, if we get real restrictive with this, we're going to start getting nuisance complaints all over. Another consideration in, in the Keitels, I, I thought it was wise to bring this up as a noise study. Because I had a call about five or six years ago from Essex, which is behind City Market. There was a noise complaint from the Lariat because they had a live band. And I was like, how are they hearing that on Essex? So I drove over there and Essex backs right up to city market. So that big wall was actually reflecting the base. Mm -hmm. So as I was driving on the highway, I couldn't hear it. But as I turned onto the street, mm -hmm. you could hear loud bass reflecting off the wall from the Lariat. Mm -hmm. And they were super like, oh, usually we have our doors closed. They closed their doors and it wasn't an issue. So I can definitely say in my experience, if they have loud music, but the doors are closed, it doesn't seem to create problems. But this open air stuff, it, it does. And, and the acoustics from big walls or alleyways or whatever, that can create weird dynamics that as police, sorry, sometimes we've got other things to do than to stand around on corners with a meter and try to figure out sources, decibel levels. And I think they, even if you did, I mean, their property is this street corner, right? Correct. And so if the music is up here, it's sound is traveling like this. Yes. You're you're not gonna read Jack Squat against the building below where the noise is originating from. And I would be curious too. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but like right across the street is the old State Department building, which is two-story brick. What is the sound reflecting off of that wall doing? So and she also talked just about the spillover after 10, the music, the music may stop. And I realized 10 is a, that's not a, a sorry, a front, you know, cut off, but um, do you deal with a lot of noise that, I mean, after as far as clothes and that kind of thing, um, and stop, you know, this one, it was interesting. There was complaints of crowd noise. So we, we've not seen too much of that, but um, I, I mean, I guess it's a growing pain, the more yeah. businesses mm -hmm. and activities on, on main streets, you know, downtown districts in Denver, the Springs, it's, there's not residential areas backing right up to those as much as we have here. Tricky, thank you. Seems like a tricky one, right? Because you just said like, they're, they're next to a place that, you know, it's good to see vibrancy downtown, right? So these businesses also have to have the ability to do things to make money and, <clears throat> But yes, at a, a time frame, maybe obviously too loud is too loud. So I'm curious if they, you know, if they had a conversation with the business owner at all, or is they just come, did, okay. They, they did, they, they didn't call us, um, which I respect that. They didn't want to interrupt this wedding. Um, we appreciate that too. Um, however, they, they did reach out to the business owner. There was some communication. Um, okay. So I think they're trying to build some bridges. Oh, that's good. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, just it's important too to keep in mind, you know, just speaking about the vibrancy and the business and not really impacting them. Um, it's also the, I mean, when the business first came, this code was in place. You know, we were part of that discussion quite a bit. And we used to live probably three houses down from the titles. Um, and it was started with all the intention of, yeah, they're not going to have bands and it's not going to be loud past seven o'clock, you know, live music or uh, amplified sound past seven o'clock. And so um, I think it's important just from a planning point of view, you know, and as we're making policy, just to think like, yeah, just because a business came and formed and then they want to change their business model after that, that it doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the community has to change because they want to change their business model during during the fact, right? Um, and there were people up and down all summer uh, as far as going to their short-term rentals and things. It was, 
extremely loud all night, you know, just from people, drug folk walking around. There's no noise issues. I mean, there were noise issues, but it's not like a code violation. But, yeah, how, like that's true. Because how would you handle that, right? So let's say they get done at ten or whatever it is, and and then, but then it's just citizens in town for whatever, and they're had a little bit too much or whatever, and they're just yelling and talking down. Is that still the business's responsibility, or is that then become, hey, those are just citizens? You know, they've left the mm -hmm. um, the business, and now they're just out on their own. So I assume then it doesn't reflect on the business. It's just the people that keep out, right? So I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, what we deal with. To that a lot too and once they leave the private property and they're in public it can become what's called disorderly conduct okay. um and, and just you know yelling and stuff often it's just a officer showing up say hey some people have to go to work in the morning okay sorry i mean usually it's that simple mm -hmm. but there, there's been times that it goes to the level of we, we have to file charges um, sure. and i mean that's we have it in neighborhoods where there's people that have, in a house they decide Hey, let's play our bass really loud at three in the morning. Right. So, so Dean, do you have much trouble with uh, with restaurants and bars over serving people? Um, yes, yeah, we have some concerns about that for sure. It, it's a difficult thing. the The law isn't necessarily over serving; it's called serving to visibly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Um, which the tips class is supposed to give people direction on recognizing that. Um, I'm not sure how diligent all of the liquor establishments are with that. Um, and that prompts some different things from the police department. But sometimes, I mean, I think just as I looked on East Main Street in that two and a half block area, there's about 16 establishments that are serving alcohol. That's a lot. And for a couple officers to try to regulate that, sometimes it's it's just by doing um, heavy DUI enforcement. So people see our lights and see our patrols saying, hey, if I get in that car and drive, I'm going to get caught. But we've had numerous calls from for things like bar fights. Um, we just had a harassment from a, a East Main establishment where the guy was yelling at people on the street. Um, and we had to have a conversation. And one of the things we can do and you can do, I think, as a board to help with that is every year I get the, the form from Paula on the liquor license renewal. So I'll document on there if we've had instances at these bars where we've got concerns of over serving or where we're constantly having noise complaints or bar fights and things like that. Um, and then um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Parker, but you guys then and gals as the licensing authority are then able to maybe um, take some action against that if they're you know not following the liquor code or they're constantly problematic. And do we have to wait for that annual review? I mean, could it happen if there are a series of violations? Yeah, it could happen anytime. So if we get a liquor violation, um, we can coordinate either with the Department of Revenue, but in my communication with them, they do prefer that local boards um, take some ownership of you know, let's have some consequences for these liquor violations. Okay. Joel, just back to your point, I, I'm not sure if you were saying that um, if they sort of change their business model, is there something that can be done there? I mean, it sounds like we don't have anything that could be done, but are you suggesting we try to address that somehow? No, it's, it's more just uh, just to, um, you know, just uh, thinking about that comment of like, oh yeah, let's, you know, let's, help the business community out and open mm -hmm. kind of open it up but also it's you know people start businesses based on certain assumptions and rules that are in place and and um and the community in place and then um, i don't think the town necessarily has a responsibility to go and change those rules because of whatever factors within their own business model may or may not be working you know okay. Then you have someone who's lived in that same spot for 35 years that suddenly their lives are impacted. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of crazy. So if someone came in from the get-go and said, we're going to have a rooftop bar with live music and events and we're going to party all night 
And that was like the business model they presented as they're starting up. Would that have been a different conversation? If, if it complies with the code right now, no. It would probably would have been a conversation for sure, but it could have been, well, we've got the decibel limits. You have to be aware of that. Comply with that, noise ordinance. And but, I mean, like I've said, the decibel limits is fairly faulty in that situation because unless you get on it, I guess you could stand on the property line and have a 20 foot pole and say, we're measuring at the property line at the horizontal level where the noise is originating, then it would be a. So, but to answer your question again, it, as long as they're complying with the code, there's not much planning or anybody else. Can code doesn't really prevent do. you from being a bad man. Yeah. And staff doesn't, we should not be in the, the business of interpreting what makes a good community business versus not. It needs to be in the code clearly. <laughs> Their complaint seems valid. It's just we don't really have a mechanism to address it without potentially. Well, I think something needs to be changed in the code. You had someone that lived in the same spot for 35 years. They should not have to change their lifestyle for new businesses that come into town. They've been pillars in our community. They were our kids' teachers for many, many years. How many times have we seen them come in here and complain? I think they have it a little a legitimate complaint. You don't see them going and turning in calls once a week or several times a year or something. I think they have a legitimate complaint and something in the code needs to be changed. Whether it's a time limit where after 10 o'clock there is no more rooftop, rooftop music, but taking um, an uh, establishment where you're on the ground floor you got your band on the ground floor it's enclosed in a building you've got a rooftop projectile to produce the band that's on the terrace and i do think that that is a lot more it carries a lot further and that there that we do need to do something in the code to protect the citizens that live in the downtown area. I think the code, though, if you did measure at the property line at the horizontal level where the noise is originating, the code might be effective. Whether it's just a certain time after 10 o'clock, it doesn't happen anymore. But if you were family that had little kids that needed to go to bed for school and they're listening to the, that music. I mean, yes, it can affect the quality of life, whether we want vibrant businesses or not. It can't come at the health of your citizens. Can I make a comment? Yeah. I don't disagree with that, but I just want to, for the argument's sake, the, to disrupt the, you know, the well-being, the health of citizens, we make this argument here, which I agree with. Remember, we have to make that everywhere else. So I'm just saying anytime something happens that might disrupt somebody that has been there or whatever, um, which is totally fine, you do have to consider then whatever is developing there. And I'll give you an example of Stackhouse. That was the same thing, disrupting all those folks that lived in that area you wanted to do. Um, an urban development, high density, and that would have affected the well-being and the lifestyle of the people that were around there. So I'm just saying, totally cool. I totally agree. But just make sure you take that that same thought process, the argument, everywhere else. Because it's the same. You're taking the same guideline of I guess, argument. Of, I, I guess I consider one a nuisance and another sort of a development issue that I don't see them in the same category. I, I those just people point. might consider a nuisance. Remember how I voted because it will affect the people that have lived there for years. They thought they were moving out into the country right. and it will affect their property values and right. it just didn't matter to Right. That's why I said it. So I, yes. Yes. Remember how I voted. Yeah. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. I could just add uh, not to that necessarily, but to the, uh, if we are looking at changing any of the ordinances, ordinances or something like maybe not 
dealing with the decibel part of it, more of the you know, like no live music at an outdoor place after 10 or no, something like that. So it's clearly identifiable and not uh, having to bring a meter with you to see if it meets decibel or not. It's clear. It's like well, it's past 10 o'clock and I hear music. So, mm -hmm. but if it's clearly more clearly defined, if we decide to go down that road route rather than dealing with decibels on property lines and where things are and triangulating, it's just clearly <laughs> that's not in the code. So whatever. But something that could be more clearly identified. If that's and your coat can go by it was only one. I mean, there are a couple, only one citizen that come in and complained, but we don't know how often other people right. complain about the noise downtown either. Well, would the board like to uh, direct staff to try to draw, draft something up? For us to vote on? I would. I don't know what other people feel about. I'd like to explore it at yeah. least and see. I know it's challenging. it sounds challenging to try to do that, but I would like to us to explore it. I think Some maybe we options. could do a work session on it, you know, if we wait till after the first of the year. I maybe even talking to the business owner because the Citizens who came in, they said it rarely happened. It's happened a few times, but not quite often. So it could be there's a solution that isn't incredibly disruptive to their business model. If it isn't happening all that often, just rarely. And so maybe there is something there for working together on it. But. And that's something that they would, uh, at least in, the, in their email, they said that they would, the business owner says that they would agree to put that into their contract with the you know, with the wedding party, you know, that no, no music after 10 or I'm sure been, that's what they said. They've had another inquiry about a rooftop um, deck or some sort of thing recently too. So it might be <coughs> something <coughs> more global than, than just for that particular yeah, business. Yeah, we're going to do something. We need to do it before there's just a whole row of this time. A rooftop bars are pretty cool. No, but not if they're just driving everybody crazy. So did I hear you directing staff that we're going to get a motion, please? Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion. I don't know what I'm going okay. to direct the staff to look into possible solutions for louder noise on rooftop establishments. I don't know. Somewhere. Got that, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a memo. <laughs> Paul's words have to get up right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have Helton Hinga and Swisher. Would you, and I'd like it if you would read back the motion, please. Oh, or John. <laughs> That's what you would you like it. Yeah. Or else we're going to slow down and you can tell me again how you want it. Okay, <laughs> she'll listen to the recording. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> clever Libby. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Your power. Or like I said, it's going to take more time than that. You're going to have to repeat it. You know, because did anybody else in the room get it word for word? No. I don't know. You can look at the recording <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay. Uh, back. Yeah. You know. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you, Devin. Do you yeah. want to speak more to that? I don't know. I just feel like it's a very difficult thing to nail down, and I feel like it's going to take a lot of staff time when we don't really have a clear idea on what we're looking to achieve with this. There's a lot of different noises. You know, I could complain that the garbage truck is too loud at seven in the morning or people's dogs in my neighborhood. There's a lot of variables with noise and different times of year. I don't know, I have a hard time nailing down or trying to reprimand a business that is on Main Street um if we haven't even talked to them directly but that's my opinion so that's fine Thanks, um 
Okay, so um, this is still trustee stuff, correct? Yeah. We need to wrap it up pretty quick. Um, Peter, would you have anything you'd like to add? No, everything I kind of want to add, I could talk about at the after party later. <laughs> Second session, I guess. <laughs> and Gina? Just uh, thank you to the Rex Department and Public Works for everything for this weekend for the event. Everything went really, really smooth and it's just really easy to work with our departments in terms of getting that stuff uh, together and anything that's needed. I have a need to talk to Leslie on something. She's super responsive and gets me anything. So um, it was just a successful event and I attribute that to the great town stuff that we have been able to put it together. So great. thank you to them. Um, Philip and I went to a program on uh, uh, Proposition HH and why that is a really confusing um, proposal and um, you know the, the county commissioners and various people from the different library districts and the school districts and um, no one's really all that sure how it's going to affect their their budgets especially if you look out 10 or 20 years um, so anyway just kind of we, we have a lot to learn on that one i think um, and then also I went to a, a webinar on um, recycling and there's a, a bill that was actually passed in 2022, um, which is uh, designed to have the producers of plastics um, pay for the cost of recycling. And so the reason I talk about it here is that um, there's a survey where they, they want us to try to figure out our, our recycling costs. And, and I would think that we should respond to the survey, uh, but it's going to take some staff time to, you know, to try to put that together. It's not really all that easy of a question. Because mm -hmm. you've got, you know, people paying private providers and then, um, the town. Well, I guess, it, I mean, it shouldn't be that hard, I guess. It, a few phone calls maybe to the companies could tell us how many, how many people are hiring them to carry, you know, carry off their recycling. And then the town pays for different recycling costs as well. Can I just maybe. come up with a number like $5 million? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. That's good. good. Put that in there. So um, anyway, it's an interesting hmm. process. They're just trying to gather some data right now on, on what are the costs of the recycling statewide. So um, that's kind of uh, it for me. Joel, do you have anything you'd like to enter here? This is one, I guess, question for the board following up. There are a couple of developers who uh, they're encouraging in various ways of the town look at the tax increment financing, at least know about it a little bit more, um, which is, uh, I guess, an opportunity to um, kind of measure where a tax base is before specific developments and then after that development, what that difference is to funnel those the increase of taxes back to the developer for um, kind of a, a payment. So um, judging like, hey, well, our development has improved the overall economy by X and therefore we get some, some property tax and things that's a little difference in there. So um, some developers are encouraging that we look at it, the crossing, I mentioned it in the presentation and, and I mentioned it afterward. And, if, if that's something you guys wanted some sort of presentation about. Um, and so I'll just open that up if it's of interest. Um, it may or may not be useful in our in our area, and, and, uh, but depending. So I'll just flip that out. And if there's interest at this point, we can do it. And if there's not, then that's fine too. Sue and I sat in on a presentation on that. Is it Loveland that has the... Double bit of short call. Okay. Maybe both. Or they might both have it. 
Um, I guess I'd be interested. I mean, I don't want to, I don't know how much staff, staff time it takes to put all that together since it into that, but um, I think it might be interesting to just see if it is of use here. I think that's just me. Meeting like a intro presentation with somebody it probably won't take that much that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. After that, it would really take maybe just consider the, the intro then. And anybody else? Yeah, I'd be interested. Yeah, I'm curious to just learn more about it because I'm not too sure exactly what we're talking about, but I'd be open to try to get the information. We just don't want to hit you all out of the blue with some random presentation oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, come to find out it's been encouraged by development. So we want to make sure the board directs the staff to bring such thing to you. As long as there's no promises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We won't talk about that any further. We'll, we'll look at putting it something on calendar here at some point but if we can find I think when you feel more staffed up what's that I think when you when your department has got a better feeling of being staffed up thank you that was all I had. <laughs> okay Philip you have um we're about to enter budget season and the public meetings here so just kind of reiterate um, next meeting we'll have a work session where we'll kick off the budget <laughs> With you all, um, department heads will present a we'll discussion with you all about you know overarching themes to the budget, and then uh, October tenth, I think, um, will be the introduction to the public, and then the board will set the public hearings, uh, which will be the the next meeting in October, the two meetings in November, and then the, the meeting in December. So. Um, all that's coming. Lots to talk about, um, including property taxes and things like that. So um, stay tuned. We're also organizing uh, advisory boards and other public entities or people that have reached out about funding. I know that you brought up uh, Alan's request, probably needs to be settled here, but um, we're trying to structure that in a way where it's comes to you logically instead of sporadically. I we'll see how we do that. But, <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Okay. Devin. Devin. Devin, where are you, Devin? I'm all good. I'm in uh, northern New Hampshire in the White Mountains at the moment. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's 1130 here. Yeah. <laughs> Play music. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing really loud music. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I'm all set. Sean. Um, yeah, I think I got this. Um, it'll be pretty quick. I'll uh, I'll I'll bring in a little bit more information, and we'll get it in the packet timely. The mm -hmm. opportunity for a letter of support for the dog park contest. With uh, I looked at the contest rules. I think the big thing is getting a dog park sign from the sponsor. It looks like a big one of that we meet the criteria. So there will be like some, you know, uh, do we own the land questions kind of coming our way. And uh, I think, you know, as many letters of support that we can get from staff. So I think we'd start maybe with the mayor and the board of trustees. And I think once we have that, we can filter down. So um, do you have anything? Yeah, just the timing on that, I think, is September 21st for the letter submission or <laughs> take, as I read all of yep. So <laughs> if the board is comfortable with that, I've looked at the terms and conditions. It's, a, it's an award, not a grant. However, there are some conditions. I didn't think anything was out of the ordinary on that. It's up to $50,000. I think it's low risk to pursue it, but we want to make sure the board's aware of when we do that kind of thing. So if the board's comfortable with that, we'd probably just move forward, submit a letter of support from the town and go for it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we could not do that. So. Yeah. Do you need a motion for that? Right. Um, is there a motion for it? Well, the letter of support. I'll make a motion. The letter of support. Okay. Is there a second? Second. 
Okay, we've got Lucrezia and Cobb. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Anyone oh, opposed? that cleaned up some space, huh? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So much. Match that. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I'm looking at our, you know, our workload. You know, I don't know if October is really that realistic for a water plant tour, but you know, I know that we probably put it off. I, I'd be happy to, you know, postpone it until spring or something like that when we have a little bit more infrastructure in place. But if you guys want to. Try to work it into all the things that we have going on right now in October. I'll make it happen, um, but that's for sure. I mean, it's been a while since people have been out there, and I know it's kind of cool. You know, I think uh, maybe we can schedule a couple of them if you're interested in doing it in October. I think once, you know, kind of once we get past, you know, October, the weather starts to become a little bit more. Uh, um, I, I guess I, I, I understand the staff issue and I have no problem delaying it, but I'm wondering if our new town administrator, Brian's going to need to go out there. And if so, is it any more burdensome if some of the rest of us go and haven't seen it? I mean, would you assume he's going to? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. Nope. That's all I'd say. Is it, I mean, don't maybe schedule it around us, but whatever works for him, open up to others. Is, does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Um, one one last thing. Um, we'll be um, coming to the board at the next meeting for the Elk Run Water Supply Protection District mm -hmm. application. So, um, you know, I'll have um, plenty of information. If, uh, definitely have um, our code, Article Two, and Chapter Thirteen awareness of that. Um, but I, you know, I, I think. Um, There'll probably be a lot, you know, a lot to consume on this. And I know some of us have, have a little bit more awareness to, to what the project is um, and where it's at and how long we've been working on it. But um, that's uh, something I'd like to, you know, try to get to you in a way that's, you know, consumable for everybody. And, you know, if uh, I think what we'll have is, is basically, you know, a pretty good location where it's at, you know, the impacts, vulnerabilities, what we're doing to mitigate that, the review, the um, consultants, the uh, people that have helped us through this, the water advice board, people like Andrew who spent some time looking at this and, um, you know, really what our, what our code says and things like that. So I uh, hope I could share that with you in a way if you wanted to kind of touch up and brush up on, on that section, it's it's Article Two and Chapter Thirteen, but I'll make sure that I have that in the report so you can have that before the meeting uh, comes once the packet gets uh, put together. Um, so, thank thanks, you. thanks. Thank you, um, Chief. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay, Paula. I do have something. Okay, changing the town election date. So by working on the 2024 election budget, the topic of changing municipal elections from April to November and coordinating with the county clerk to conduct the elections came up. With increasing scrutiny of the election processes, security requirements, securing a ballot print vendor, finding people to serve as judges, previous discussion of ranked voting and developing long-term watching procedures, would it be in the best interest to coordinate with the county? Changing the regular municipal municipal election date from April to November and extending the current elected officials terms from April to November would be have to be approved by the voters. So if this is something that the board would like to consider, you know, let us know because it would have to go to a vote and that would have to occur in April of 2024. Currently right now for the 2024 election, the budget is set at $8,000. And that's utilizing the ballot envelopes purchased in 2000. Staff will print, fold, attach million labels, stop, stamp, and seal ballot envelopes. Currently, we have approximately 2,300 active voters. So, so in the past, town staff has always conducted the elections. But going for, you know, in the future, if the board wants to decide, we can coordinate with the county like what Salida does. And then the county clerk would conduct our elections. 
And how much would that cost? Well, Lori, rec um, I reached out to Lori and she said it would cost between $8,000 and $11,000, depending on the number of entities coordinating and if a TABOR notice is involved. And I, I think what Paul has identified for next April's election is a very efficient number, 8,000. I don't see that being the case. Like she said, that's using existing uh, envelopes, things like that. So it would easily exceed 12,000 uh, to conduct our own, to continue, continue to conduct our own elections. And that doesn't factor in the staff time that is right. going to take. So. Do, you, do you all have a recommendation then? Uh, Paula and I highly recommend the board consider this. It's a it's a consideration, so it's not a hey, let's put this on the ballot right yeah. now. Right. Yeah. But or I think we're recommending further consideration of this and understanding, um, yeah, the points that Paula uh, pointed out a little bit more deeper uh, because it it will have to go to the voters, and and we will need to explain the what and the why. Um, but I think there's some pretty compelling reasons why we would explore that. Well, the school board is already on that schedule right there in the November. November. <laughs> so we're the only ones who are. Kind of an outlier. Yeah. So why is November? School districts are in November. Mm -hmm. County's in November. District is on there. And it is confusing to our voters. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they go to the wrong locations, things mm -hmm. like that. So there's some efficiencies, not just dollar wise, but process wise. Mm -hmm. So um, what would you like for us to do? Do you want this to be on an agenda or we need to study it first or? or... <clears throat> we could do it as an agenda item and things and then we can work in tandem with Jeff and Catherine as far as you know, the next steps and things as far as putting it on the ballot in, in April. And the good thing is having, this would force us to have an election in April. There'll be four um, seats up in April. If we only get four candidates, then once again, we would cancel the election by having this ballot question on there that forces us to an election. Plus it also gives town staff the opportunity to learn how to do an election. Because right now it's Philip and I and Brian has done one in Poncha. That's it. So it would be a good opportunity for staff to learn the process of an election. Or do you learn it and then never use it again? Possibly. Possibly. Right. But I'd there rather have it the other way around. But there'll be also facets of it that they're going to need to know anyway, as far as the petition process and the notification processes, town staff would still have to do all that. that. It's okay. actually the conducting of the election as far as sending out, you know, mailing the ballots, sending them out, receiving them in, tabulating the ballots. And there again, you have to have judges in place to do that. Um, for the last election, we made sure that our cameras were placed where that um, during the counting and things that those were there. Our big concern is if we have a watcher, you all have been in town hall, where are we going to set up the counting of ballots and also have a watcher area? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it makes a lot of sense to so combine, combine it. Yeah, but there again, it's going to have to be something that we have to work on, coordinate, and go to the vote of the people. And also there is the factor that it will extend terms of offices, you know, from April to November. I didn't, hear any, I didn't see anyone score on all of a sudden. So. It was a silent screen. Yeah. So do so I think we should Sue looking at it? Yes, I think so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I left out. Anybody? Peter? No, I have not. Peter? Okay, and just take, take us back, not to extend, and I sent us down one big rabbit hole, but did we want to talk about Al, the request from Alan Robinson, or just did you want to weave that into the budget? No, I, well, it wasn't clear to me, was he requesting the funds now in 2023? He's actually requesting 2024 funds. Oh, okay. So we could wait. Yeah, but he, he needs a letter to that effect that he could turn in in, in October. 
So he wants a letter saying that we support his idea, you know, of applying for the grant and that he'll, and that we, we would do the match. Or not. So we, we, did, we, we could intend to do the 1800, right? I mean, we've done we that before. We can't come totally commit it. We can't commit it, but we can yeah. say that we're prioritizing it within the budget for next year. We, we do that with other entities. So, yeah. If, if we want, we could ask him for a draft letter. We could put that in the next packet and then we could incorporate that into the draft budget and then let the board, you know, let the process kind of decide if it stays in the budget or not. Okay. That's how I think we should do that. Okay. okay. So we would direct staff to ask Alan Robinson for a letter. Okay, well. I think we are done with our business items now. <laughs> Which means that <laughs> We can decide if we want to go into executive session and then do that. Okay. Let's see. Um, Mayor? Yeah. We're going to have uh, attorney, water attorney Cindy Cavell on for the uh, what's now listed as the second. Okay. Executive session. Become the if first. It's okay with it. We could swap those. That way, we can get her on and off. Good idea. Very good idea. Is that okay? Yeah. Sorry, Jeff. You're stuck with this all night long. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so. That's all right. That's all right. I expect him to be here. So I'm going to want a motion from uh, from a uh, trustee. Um, that trustee will move that the board of trustees enter into executive session. And uh, the topic will be the topic will be an executive session to determine positions relative to matters that will be subject to negotiations, develop a strategy for negotiations and or instruct negotiators pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Section 24-6-4024E concerning the purchase agreement for 50 acre feet of water from the Upper Arkansas Water Cons Conservancy District. Following that session, there will be another executive session to determine positions relative to matters that may be subject <coughs> to negotiations, develop a strategy for negotiations, and or instruct negotiators pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Section 24-6-4024E concerning the Sangre de Cristo Electric Association Wildfire Fire Mitigation and Vegetation Management Program. Um, so is there a, a motion to go into executive session? I so move. Second. So we have Cobb and the Kretzi. Um, and then um, I'd like to do a roll call vote on uh, going into these executive sessions, please. Trustee Cobb. Yes. Trustee Hilton Hinga. Yes. Trustee the Kretzi. Yes. Trustee Rice. Yes. Trustee Bill. Yes. Trustee Swisher is not in the room. Okay, well, we have, a, we have a greater than two thirds vote to go into executive session. So um, let's now take a break. And then we'll come back and go into executive session. Cindy, we're going to take like a five minute break. Thank you. We'll be back on in just a moment. Well, I want to say for your guys' sound issues, Salida has a similar problem, and they made an ordinance 